What's up, freaks? This rip was brought to you by River. River's a Bitcoin company built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners the right way. There's no trusted third parties. They build all their infrastructure. They have free DCA because they know it's the best way to buy Bitcoin. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, you want to mine Bitcoin, you want to send Bitcoin over the Lightning Network, you want to plug into their Lightning Network API. If you're a developer, they're building all these tools for you. They also encourage self-custody. Again, they're Bitcoiners. They want to provide an on-ramp for you and then teach you and encourage you to take control of your own Bitcoin. And they're doing this. It's a beautiful company. If you do hold Bitcoin on the exchange, you can know for sure, since they don't rely on any third parties, they don't lend your Bitcoin out, they don't speculate with your Bitcoin, your Bitcoin is held in a multi-sig wallet with 100% reserves. Okay, so go to river.com slash TFTC, take advantage of the no fee DCA, you set up your dollar cost average, you don't pay any fees on those buys. If you're a developer, they have their Lightning Network Services API that you can build on, you can send over Lightning, you can mine via river as well uh, you may have your exchange you may be comfortable with it but if you have you tried river yet it's a question you have to ask yourself if the answer is no go try it that's where all the bitcoiners are hanging out that's where i get my bitcoin as well river.com slash tftc thank you guys for listening if you're listening on youtube please subscribe set the notifications up as well we're going to be putting out a lot of content this year uh, if you want to Subscribe to the podcast feed as well. If you're not around your computer or not listening on YouTube, but you want to catch the podcast on the podcasting feeds, subscribe on your favorite podcasting app. And if you want to learn more about Bitcoin, I write a, a newsletter almost daily during the week. Go to tftc.io, subscribe on the website, and you'll get pure signal on Bitcoin, macroeconomics, geopolitics, whatever tickles my fancy that day. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for supporting the show. If you can subscribe, rate, review, it goes a long way. We're trying to blow this up in 2023. Enjoy the rip. Lodgy, welcome to the show. Marty, good to be here. I'm very excited for this conversation. I mean, we've been having a few sidebar conversations on the state of the world, uh, the fiat crisis, in the future, what's going to happen here in the United States and globally. So let's just jump into it. The fiat crisis, I mean, <clears throat> big in the news right now. We just had the debt ceiling raised yet again. Uh, not yep. surprising. People, particularly the Republicans, will, will LARP like they're going to hold the line. But the ceiling always inevitably gets raised. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so it looks like uh, we've got more trillions to be added to the national debt here. What does the debt ceiling, how does that contribute to the fiat crisis that we find ourselves in right now? Yeah, so so the debt ceiling issue itself is uh, it's just one of like thirty things, um, you know. At least at the time of this pod, uh, there's like some procedural vote. The actual deal hasn't gone through. Who knows what'll happen? Um, but just to engage that specifically for a second, uh, they're about to issue something like six months worth of treasuries to try to refill the the Treasury General account and try to basically. <clears throat> make up for lost time. And that is going to flood the market with treasuries. And uh, this guy, William Middlecoop, observed that the last time that happened, where there was a kind of last minute debt ceiling, and then they issued a bunch of treasuries in 2019, it caused this whole reverse repo crisis. And the Fed actually had to start uh, printing in September 2019, even before all the COVID stuff. So it's quite possible that the debt ceiling thing, you know, the deal is actually just the beginning of a series of dominoes, uh, you know, if anything like 2019 happens. So that's A. Um, but B is really uh, the thing about this year's debate, which was good, is that it actually focused much more attention on um, the, the genuine long term problems facing the USA. It, it felt a little different than in previous years. I'm not sure if you had the same feeling. Um, where, you know, that it, it wasn't like this procedural kind of drama over previous years where it's just a political thing. This did feel like something where folks were engaged on both sides, um, at least at least among the Twitteria, you know, the commentariat. And maybe that's the difference is in previous times with even 
2011, you didn't have social media to the same extent. So you didn't really have authentic commentary. You just had the, you know, melodrama horse race of the, uh, the mainstream media. But I think, you know, just keeping the debt ceiling aside, uh, you know, for itself, the national debt has gone to something like 30 trillion. Have you seen that graph that EX John has made where it's like just kind of, kind of going? Yeah, just the red. It's like a exponential yeah. to the downside. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe we can bring that. Actually, I, let me see if I can project that or we can find that in the show notes. Let's see here. Um, here we go. Can you project that? Send it. If you send me a link on Signal, I can send it to Logan. We can get it up. Oh yeah, here actually, I can also just um, can can I share the screen? You should be able to. Okay, let's do that. Boom! Can you see that? Yep. All right. So. Uh, you know, some people say, oh, it's not a fair graph, you know, et cetera. But basically, this is the accumulated debt over many different presidents. Um, this is the revenue and this is the deficit. That's like the one a few set of years where there was like a surplus. Right. And this is due to bond issuance and also deficit spending, you know, where the deficit is greater than the revenues. But essentially what you're seeing is, um, you know, people talk about debt to GDP ratio. But I think debt to revenue ratio is actually sort of more realistic. Like if you have five hundred thousand uh, dollars in in debt and you have one hundred thousand dollars in annual income, you're basically never going to pay off that debt. You know, like if it's five total years of you doing nothing other than paying debt, obviously you have to live. So I mean, even ten percent of your income going to debt is quite a lot, but one hundred percent going to debt is is just too much, right? And paradoxically, what's happened is. As this has gone more and more, whether it's exponential or quadratic, whatever the actual form of the curve is, but it's, it's going quite crazy towards the end here. As this has gone crazier, you know what people have concluded? They, they operate as if deficits don't matter because it's the longer and longer the time since they've been chin checked by reality, the more they think that it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the right? MMT thesis, right? That is just money we yeah. owe ourselves. Well, it's it's even more than MMT. It's basically something where even if you weren't an mmt -er and you didn't think you could print infinitely, you just think, well, we've done it and nothing happened, so let's do it some more. We did some more and nothing happened, so let's do it some more, right? And uh, so this is actually, Dalio makes this point, that the further away you get from a crushing global sovereign debt crisis and deleveraging, paradoxically, the closer you get to the next one, because people become incautious, right? They just assume, it, you know, you can literally never, you know, have a problem here, right? So this is one graph, okay? The second graph that I sometimes show people, if I'm showing people, you know, um, this one is something where it's like, people are just totally unrealistic in, in some ways, I think. And, um, and, and sometimes these graphs are like helpful to... Uh, just kind of anchor. But like the other day, um, this one got like a few million views or whatever, but it's basically a, hold on. Here. Show you a few, a few more just for like reality check, just to anchor people, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so if, that, if that's a graph of US debt, okay? Here's a graph of Chinese, um, steel production, which looks like the total opposite graph, okay? So here, back in, you know, people will, will always give me and probably you these historical metaphors, and they'll say, oh, Balaji, oh, Marty, you know, you underestimate us. We won the world wars, and, you know, we beat the Japanese, and Churchill always said that we do the right thing after doing everything else, and you underestimate our capability to reinvent ourselves, and, you know, the 70s were bad, but we got past that, blah, blah. And all of those historical analogies just don't actually reckon with, you know, you can only do a historical analogy if there's time series similarity, right? The, mm -hmm. the numbers constrain the letters, you know? And so here... If you look at the numbers, um, the U.S. was like, you know, 70 and no, actually like 110 something megatons of steel in like 1968 or something like that. Right. And China was like 14 megatons of steel, that thin little red thing, tiny, tiny thing. 
Now today, you know, 50-ish years later, the US is down like 30, 40%, it's like 72 megatons of steel, and China is a billion megatons of steel, more than the entire rest of the world combined. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's like we were discussing this too, it's like you had the Peter Zahans of the world who will like point at China and be like, China's gonna fail, but I think a good way to approach this is just like to take the names off the chart and just look at the chart and say, all right, on this chart, who do you think is gonna succeed massively, whether it be steel production, or increased energy production in places like China and India, if you were to take the names off the chart and just look at it, you'd be like, oh, these countries are, are going to succeed. That's right. The and, most. and the thing is, look, if you think about this as like an executive at a company, okay, it, uh, it, there's a lot of people who will try to frame it as, oh my God, you're talking bad about America. That means you must hate America. Well, you know what that's like saying is like, um, oh, uh, I, I'll, let me show you one more chart and then I'll come back to this point. Um, Here's one more chart. This got a lot of views. And this shouldn't have been a surprise, honestly, to anybody. But um, this, this chart was like a huge surprise to people. And it should be like, you know, just table stakes. So this is the one where it's like, um, you know, Chinese trade with the world, right? In, in the year 2000, can you see the screen there? Yep. In the year 2000, blue are the countries that trade more with the USA and orange are the countries that trade more with China. So China had like some African countries and Central Asian or whatever. 20 years later, and this is actually like three or four years ago, basically, um, everybody trades more with China than the US pretty much, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's like one country that flipped the other way, like Estonia or something like that, okay? Um, but, and I love Estonia, it's a great country, but I think that's the only one on this graph that like flipped the other way. So for the most part, and maybe that's like arms or who, I don't know what it is. Point is though, that broadly speaking, if you're trying to get people, if you're forcing people to decouple and you just look at this graph and you're saying the US is trying to force you to choose between the US and China and the US is forcing the issue, which countries don't want the issue to be forced, who are they gonna pick? <laughs> They're gonna pick China because China sells them their chairs and their, and their screws, right? Like a lot of people, you know, I, look, I love high tech, okay? I love high tech, I've devoted my life to high tech. But you know what? China can crush you on low tech. They'll screw you on the screws. They will literally right. just deny you screws. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and their scale production is just bananas. And so, you know, the thing is, as, as I was just mentioning, and, and you and I were just talking about with Zaihan, is like, I have no beef with Zaihan, by the way. Like, I think he's like a well-meaning guy. Nothing is zero, nothing personal. I just want to say that because sometimes people are like, oh my God, you're trashing him. But not at all. Um, but I do think in 2008, for example, remember when the mortgages were rated AAA? Mm -hmm. was, was it beneficial to either the lender or the borrower to delude the borrower into thinking that they were AAA, uh, you know, mortgages? Like that, that these people actually had good credit? Go ahead. It was bad for both, all right. It's bad for both because the borrower is stuck with a loan they can't pay and the lender is stuck with a loan that's going to default. And both of them are essentially, it's just a trade that doesn't make sense for either side and cause massive damage to everybody else, all third parties, everybody who got a job on that basis of the, the substance of that economic transaction, they're all wrecked. And this is the same issue. It's like, you know, do you know what happened in, in 2011 with the S&P and their downgrade of U.S. debt? Mm-hmm. Yeah, to, just like the mortgage downgrade to what like a well that's the thing just like mortgages were faked triple a the u.s government debt was fake triple a and the snp downgraded in the last debt debt ceiling debacle in 2011 to i think like double a or something like that it's still double a and do you know, do you know what the u.s government did to snp they ordered a federal investigation and their president had to step down and obama tongue lashed them right and that's the thing is like you, you've heard the saying too big to fail right mm -hmm. The, the entire U.S. establishment, it's all too fake to tell. <laughs> all, this, all the financial stats have been faked for the last 15 years. Okay? It's not just AAA mortgages. It, see, the reason is that AA rating is like the observed unobservable. Because if those agencies were free to actually give freely furling ratings like they do for like El Salvador, right? That's actually like a market determined rating, okay? If the agencies could actually give freely floating ratings to the USA, they would have downgraded its debt. But yeah. they're not, they can't because there's a gun to their head, you know? 
And, uh, and this is true not just for mortgages, not just for U.S. sovereign debt. It's true for uh, the assets that the Fed bought back at 100 cents on the dollar whether it was mortgage-backed securities that they were purchasing you know, after the financial crisis. It's true for the stocks that they're propping up with the exchange stabilization fund. It's true for, you know, some people have, have, have thought that uh, the VIX itself, that the Fed is, you know, putting puts and calls on it to try to keep it in range so that it can't actually bounce up too much. Um, and, you know, it's like Greenspan's plunge protection team in like the late 90s, you know, where like, OK, just like what it sounds like, they would just buy assets and, and prop it up. And, uh, and on and on and on it goes where um, inflation is transitory. They, they fake that until they couldn't fake that. Crime is down in San Francisco. Oh, because crime reporting is down. Obviously, your window is smashed, your car is stolen, nothing happens. Um, in the early days of COVID, they said that there were no... Now, I know this will be a controversial case among your, you know, maybe, maybe some, some folks here, but um, like February 2020, people are saying there were no COVID cases in the US. And part of the reason was the FDA was blocking tests. It was literally like people had to do civil disobedience to actually run the tests to find out that COVID was actually present in the U.S. People were saying it wasn't. And uh, and there's so many things like this. I mean, another example is ju just, you know, accrual accounting versus cash accounting. Are you familiar with the mm -hmm. distinction? Yeah. Yep. The government, you know, or many governments exempt themselves, <clears throat> state governments, federal government, exempt themselves from accrual accounting. They don't actually take into account the current um the, the obligations they've taken on in the form of pensions and so on. If they did, they'd be obviously massively and totally bankrupt. By the way, if you're a public company, you have to do accrual accounting. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's forced on you, right? That's market accountability, but, uh, but the state exempts itself, right? So like the totality of this, it's like at the end of the USSR, all the factory stats were fake. At the end of the USSA, all the financial stats are fake. Like the whole thing, you know, like this, the, without the printer, um, you know, the exorbitant privilege, right? Uh, check your exorbitant privilege. When that thing goes down, you know, what, what happened to the Soviet Union when it went down? All of these factories that were uh, like selling cars, you know what happened? Those cars were actually worth more if they're melted down as like raw metal. <laughs> okay. Like the Ladas, L-A-D-A, I think it's like the Soviet car. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the exact brand of those, but like, the Soviet factories, because they weren't in a competitive marketplace, were literally adding no value, negative value, okay, yeah. to the cars that they were making. And the entire Soviet system had been distorted for so long that everybody was trained on the wrong signals. And that is basically where we are in the USSA. And it's predominantly with financial products, right? It's, like it's, yes, it's with financial products. I mean, it's, it's interesting because... Uh, you know, this is part of a, should I riff on this for a second? I know, I'm, I think there's an interesting digression here. Should I talk about this for a second? Uh, definitely. Okay. So one of my macro theses is that history is running in reverse. And so like it, 1950 is like peak centralization and you have, uh, you have one, um, one telephone company, AT&T, and you have two superpowers, the US and USSR, and you have three TV stations, ABC, CBS, NBC. Okay. And if you go forward and backward in time, power starts decentralizing. So you go backwards in time, 1890, you have the, uh, the American frontier closes, but forward in time, the internet frontier opens. You go backwards in time, you have Spanish flu, forwards in time, you have COVID-19. Backwards in time, you have the captains of industry, the robber barons, forwards in time, you have the tech billionaires, right? And uh, I think the reason for this, there's like many, many more examples. Um, a few more. Backwards in time, you have Russia and China are in a partnership, but the Soviet Union is a senior partner. Forwards in time, you have Russia and China in a partnership, but China is a senior partner. Right? You know, go backwards in time, you have, um, you know, the UK is, is running India. Now, India is arguably the senior partner in the India-UK relationship, just like the, the China-Russia flip, right? And, and it goes down to, like, really granular levels. Like, you know, 70 years ago, you had... Um, you know, British origin guys supervising the partition of India. Now you have an Indian origin guy in the UK and a Pakistani origin guy in Scotland debating the partition of the UK. OK. And by the way, I'm not like triumphalist about that or anything like that. Right. I, I think both those would be, you know, bad in different ways. I'm just saying it's like this insane thing where many of the same hinge points in history are coming Again, but with the opposite outcome. One more example. In the 1930s, the New York Times sided with Stalinist Russia against Ukraine. 
in the early 2020s, the New York Times has sided with Ukraine against nationalist Russia. Okay. <laughs> And in, in the 1930s, the New York Times tried to essentially and did successfully suppress the news. Walter Durante managed to choke out Ukraine, and they assisted Russia in choking out Ukraine. Um, this time, they tried to work with Ukraine to sanction Russia, but it didn't work. Okay? So you're seeing, it's almost like an origami thing. You know, have you seen these complicated origami things? You fold them up one way and you fold them back the other way, right? I'm not... I'm not wise enough to understand the fullness of what I just talked about. There's like 50 more examples like this. It's actually bananas, you know? I mean, the specificity of them is pretty, pretty remarkable, you know? Um, and w but what I think the macro of it is, is that going into 1950, we've had several hundred years of centralizing technology. You've had uh, mass media and mass production and, you know, the factory. And this, you know, going all the way through American history up till about 1950, from Washington to Lincoln to Woodrow Wilson and to, to Roosevelt, and of course, Teddy Roosevelt as well, you have generally increasing centralization going into like roughly 1950. And then with the invention of the transistor, you start going in reverse gradually. It's not obvious at first. Some things have more momentum and they keep centralizing, you know, more federal regulations, but things start now moving in the opposite directions, like the second derivative. Okay, so you go to transistor, you have cable news, you have personal computer, internet, smartphone, cryptocurrency, AI, you start decentralizing. Okay, and um, so that's like one dynamic. And the second dynamic is ideological ricochet. So one of the things I have in the Network State book, and this is just, I, I'm just mentioning the Network State book because it's like a placeholder for some of the concepts here, you know, like longer version if anybody cares. Uh, it's all free, you, you can look at it, you know. But, um, Related to that, all the, the uh, you know, in 1991, okay, to first order, um, the USA was on the capitalist right, and the Soviet Union was on the communist left. Okay, let's let's say 1988 before the you know everything fell apart, and that was kind of acknowledged that the economic axis was the primary axis in the world, and you had the communists on the left and you had the capitalists on the right. Okay, and Russia and China were quote, far left communist, and the USA was on the right capitalist. And then you had like Western Europe kind of clustered with it. And then you had like soft socialist, you know, India and um, Israel actually was like, it had its kibbutzes and whatnot. It was like soft socialist, right? Okay. And then Switzerland arguably is in the middle as the neutral party. And now 30 years later, after a time of sort of ideological um, ricochet, now I would argue the farthest left group in the world is the U.S. establishment as distinct from red America. Let me partition out red america right but the u.s establishment with the the progress flag you know like blinken you know raising the progress flag on the official twitter account um that's the one that's like the pride flag but with the triangle on it okay yep um you have uh, so the u.s establishment is the farthest left group in the world and uh the um uh, can you see me yep you just kind of blanked out for a second okay um your connection let's see uh okay so your internet you, you want to maybe connect to internet or something like that, just FYI. Okay. okay. Um, so the U.S. establishment is like the farthest left group in the world, and the Chinese, quote, communists are actually like, in a sense, the farthest right group in the world. And except now the axis is not economics, but it's culture. Because the wokes are culturally left, and the Chinese are culturally right. And I, this is a caricature, but I think to first order it's true. The woke ideology is, you know, white people are the worst. And the Chinese ideology is Han Chinese people are the best. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, where what's in the middle is Bitcoin and, uh, you know, the Internet, which basically is, you know, everybody is treated uh, equally according to the rules of the Internet. And it's neither negative nor positive discrimination on the basis of, um, you know, unchangeable characteristics, right? And I think of that as actually the general, genuine successor of like the, um, the constitutional order or, or what have you. But that flip where the U.S. went from the capitalist right to the woke left and the Chinese and Russians went from the communist left to the nationalist right is like this crucial thing to decode the world that most people don't even understand has happened. Right. Once you can see that, go ahead. I was going to say, it's just been like death by a thousand cuts slowly, but surely over the course of decades. It's, it, that's right. It's all, it's gradual, you know, but, but I think now at this point it's undeniable. And now actually much of the rest of the world has flipped where now 
India and the Visegrad countries, all the Warsaw Pact countries, all the countries that were socialist-ish, you know, they weren't communist, but they were socialist or, or they were under the Soviet Union, you know, those countries are now like center-right. They're not like all the way nationalist, right? Like, you know, chest thumping, you know, like the, the, the Russian Z and, and so on are, but they're center-right. And, uh, and then conversely, the um, Western European countries are arguably center-left which means they're actually to the cultural right of the USA. If you think about it, you know, the New York Times keeps denouncing Macron. They denounce um, many European leaders for, oh, they're too close to China, or, oh, you know, they, they want to control immigration or something like that, right? Oh, they're less enthusiastic about some of the cultural transformations. Basically, woke America is just all the way out here on one pole when it comes to some of this stuff, right? It's a farthest left culture in the world. And, um, the thing about this is, uh, you know, it's not it's not a complete mirror image. Obviously, there's some countries like North Korea or Cuba that are like stuck in a time warp or whatever, right? Um, but uh, but it's it's enough of a mirror image to kind of say, okay, uh, that plus the fact that we're now decentralizing, I think we have a lot of the same conflicts, but with opposite outcomes. So, for example, I mentioned that the New York Times is now siding with um, Ukraine versus Russia, whereas 90 years ago they were siding with Russia to choke out Ukraine. OK, um, last time they were successful. Russia defeated uh, Stalinist Russia, defeated Ukraine. This time we'll see if Ukraine defeats Russia. It's looking it's looking like a tie or whatever right now. Who knows what's going to happen? But the initial huge wave versus Russia didn't work, the financial nuking. And now it looks like a grinded out kind of conflict. And Russia isn't going anywhere because it's literally there. And like because the U.S. can bow, it probably will at some point. But we'll see. Right. Blinken has talked about, you know, having a, a white flag on this. Charles Kupchin of Foreign Affairs is um, writing about how they need an exit strategy. Uh, and Foreign Affairs itself has admitted the world is now multipolar rather than unipolar. Their experts have. And uh, this woman, Fiona Hill, who's like a national security person who's like big into Russiagate and so on. Glenn Greenwald j talked about how she has also essentially admitted that the U.S. has lost much of the world on this Ukraine thing. Right. Now, how does that all affect the fiat crisis? Basically, um, if kind of the ascent into 1950 was the US essentially like winning every single battle and things centralizing, now it's like kind of happening in reverse. And uh, just the fact that the world is multipolar, that foreign affairs is admitting that, because we kind of knew it was for a while, but the fact that foreign affairs is admitting it, do you know what I'm talking about, by the way? Did you see that, that poll? Here it is. It's, it's phrased in a weird way, okay? So like, it, like the poll is not um, here. Is this, I think I might have seen it, the poll trying to gauge the... Yeah, so here we go. Willingness right? of Americans to be involved. Well, it's a slightly different. It's like, it's, it's, it's phrased a little weird. It's like a double negative. The global distribution of power today is closer to being unipolar than it is to being bipolar or multipolar. So if you strongly agree, you're saying it's still a unipolar world. If you strongly disagree, you're saying it's bipolar or multipolar. Okay. Now, foreign affairs is like the, you know, the most establishment of establishment kind of outlets. Okay. And when they have overwhelming agreement, or rather, overwhelming disagreement that the world is unipolar, okay, it's now, it's now a multipolar world. Now, here's what that means. That, that's not just like some random ass statement, okay? That has immediate implications. Like this, this entire thing, the unipolar moment from like roughly 1991 to 2021, it's like basically about 30 years, it's, it's done. So here's what that means specifically. All these countries around the world from Turkey to Russia to China to India are now setting their own policies and the U.S. can't stop them. Okay, so the State Department in that country can say something, but that country can just ignore it and do what it wants, which was not true for the last 30 years. I'll give some concrete examples, even for allies, by the way. So uh, with the Arab League, they all went and uh, met with Assad even though the U.S. threatened sanctions for normalizing relations with, with Syria. Um, in Japan, uh, there was a soldier named Reed Alconis who was detained. And even though a U.S. senator was yelling at them online, um, they, they still 
prosecuted that that soldier, right? I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that like the country is disobeying the U.S. Brazil went and it housed uh, Iranian warships. Again, the U.S. like some senator yelled at them. Nothing happened. Okay, Taiwan. Um, when, when again, whether it was a senator or congressman, I forget, but somebody, some, some senior muckety muck said, oh, the U.S. should blow up TSMC if, uh, <laughs> if China invades. Do you see this? Okay. Yes. And Taiwan said, if the U.S. tries to do that, we'll shoot down the U.S. plane that does it. Okay. So those are like, you know, that's Taiwan, that's Japan, that's Syria, that's Brazil. Okay. The U.S. establishment is just losing control of events. I mean, there's many more examples. It's China negotiating the peace treaty between Saudi and Iran. Now, all three of them are on the same side with the U.S. on the outside. It is um, China negotiating the end of the Yemen war. It is, um, you know, Erdogan winning. The, you know, I, who knows, like, what exactly happened that election? I, you know, Byzantine politics or Byzantine, who the heck knows what happened? All right. Um, I've, I don't know what's going on in a country with 30 percent inflation and he's, he's got roaring crowds. Who knows? OK, still. Um, Blinken, through gritted teeth, was was forced to basically say, well, congratulations to you. OK. And, uh, you know, you have France going to China and shaking hands with Xi and saying he's not so bad. Um, you have Xi convening all of the guys in Central Asia, like who are basically Russia's backyard is now China's backyard. You know, all those Central Asian post-Soviet countries are now like basically in China's camp. Um, Russia itself is trading in Yuan. Uh, you have Southeast Asia, like all the ASEAN countries, the 10 of them have declared that they're going to de-dollarize. The, you know, the president of Indonesia said that that's a priority. They want to make sure they have local card networks rather than Visa and MasterCard. You have the ACU, the, um, the Central Asian group of nine countries saying the same thing. We only one overlapping country. I think this is Myanmar. And you just have, uh, you have South Africa saying that, you know, if it was up to them, they would not enforce this international criminal court thing on, on Putin and that they side with Russia basically in this. And they're saying that to a BBC guy. You have uh, you have Egypt, you know, obviously de defying. Um, you basically have country after country after country where it's a global revolt against, you know, like Americans want to think of themselves as being independent from um, the UK. And that's obviously a real thing. This is all these countries declaring their independence from America. That does not mean that they're anti-American. That's a crucial thing. Like, it means that they're just moving on their own axis. They're like pro, you know, Brazilian, or they're pro-French, or they're, you know, pro-Indian, or they're pro-X, or y, they're pro-Saudi, whatever, right? Um, they're pro themselves, and they want to basically operate on their own axis, and they don't want to do what the State Department has been telling them to do, and now, because so many of them are doing it at the same time, the US establishment doesn't have the power level to force them to all do what the US establishment wants. That is the impact of multipolarity. Now, that actually has a domestic impact. Sorry, I know I've been going on. Should I pause there? Was that, was that, go ahead. No, I mean, it's, it all makes a lot of sense. I, obviously, hindsight's 2020, but when you consider the first two decades of this century with the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, the pullout, the financial crisis. Like, I mean, the U.S. Is, is obviously in a weak, weak spot. You know, the thing is, the, one of the things that's remarkable to me is there's absolutely no discussion of Afghanistan and Iraq. There's no discussion of it. It was like, you know, we got into a rebound war six months after the Afghanistan pullout. Because, I think in part because the blob was embarrassed. Yeah, you know? they wanted to sweep it under the rug. Yeah, or it's like, oh, we can't lose twice or something like that, right? And like in a real sense, Ukraine was like, you know, a Amur Propera had been wounded. And, you know, of course, it's more complicated than that, but that's certainly one of the motivations, you know? Um, and, and the thing about the Ukraine thing, obviously, like innocent Ukrainians are being killed. I can't endorse this stupid invasion. Uh, you know, like uh, I'm very sympathetic to the Eastern Europeans, the Estonians and so on who just got their independence from the Soviet Union and don't want to be forcibly reintegrated. I get all of that. Um, the, the thing is that uh, the U.S. is about, or the U.S. establishment, I should say, because the U.S. is not a unitary entity anymore. You know, the U.S. is actually at least three warring tribes. There's Blue America, Red America, and then like the tech guys, which are currently Gray America, but they're really like a global group that is just alighted in America. And the reason I say that is, um, 
uh, Blue America for the last, I mean, one way of writing the history of the last 10 years is the Blue Tribe has basically been in both decline and simultaneous war with everybody else, right? For example, Blue Tribe is at war with Trump, obviously, every single day, and Republicans. It's at war with tech. And Zuck, I mean, just, again, headline after headline after headline attacking tech guys, whatever. It's at war, obviously, with Russia, literally now physically, but, but digitally for a long time with Putin. It's at war with China, yelling at China all, all the time. And you may agree with some of these things, by the way. But I'm just saying they're fighting tech, Trump, Russia, China, but also to a lesser extent, but a real extent, Israel, India, Brazil, France, Hungary, like Saudi, um, I mean, Iran, obviously, everybody, they're taking on all comers. It's like, you know, like a, they're, they're basically, and for, for a time until about, let's say 2021, it actually looked like they were winning. Okay, because they'd mm -hmm. inherited so much institutional oomph that they had, you know, the New York Times and they had the Fed and they have, you know, Harvard and they have all these institutions and all this money and they could just go bam, bam, bam and spend down their trust to accuse this guy of, you know, like, like, oh, my God, Zuckerberg is so evil for for what's it called Cambridge Analytica. It was totally fake. Russiagate, totally fake. Right. Um and uh, many of these things that they've accused people of are basically totally fake, a lot of the cancellation stuff. But ultimately, what's happened now is, once you see it that way, by the way, rather than as, quote, the US versus Russia and China, or just Democrat versus Republican, but you look at it as a network, and you look at Blue Tribe just fighting a bunch of other tribes in the same network, right? Some of those tribes obviously have enmity with each other. Red Tribe doesn't like Chinese tribe either. Um, and, but but a big part of what Blue Tribe tried to do is it tried to keep the other tribes from ganging up on it. For example, at the end of 2016, do you remember when Trump had that meeting of tech CEOs? Mm -hmm. Right after that, Travis Kalanick got singled out to just get purged and attacked because Blue Tribe did not want Gray Tribe and Red Tribe to gang up on it. So put a wedge between those two, just smash make sure that Travis is like humiliated for saying something lukewarm about Trump or whatever then, okay? So they wanted to put a wedge, make sure their enemies, and by the way, when I, 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 I describe this as if it's intentional, and it might be intentional at the level of some senior editor somewhere, right? But a lot of it is emergent network behavior, you know, in the same way that you don't tell your white blood cells to go and fight something off, right? The, the queen colony, uh, the, the queen of an ant colony doesn't give instructions to every individual ant. There's emergent behavior as well as totally centralized. We understand decentralized networks. So Blue Tribe, it, you know, when gray and red were maybe cooperating, boom, they flying wedge in between. They go after Kalanick, purge, purge poor Travis. And um, then, uh, you know, when there was some hint, maybe of Putin making some positive noises towards Trump or whatever, they had this whole fake Russia story so that, that you know, Trump and Russia couldn't, couldn't uh, pair up. And, uh, you know, then um, the, you know, there's various other kinds of things like that. Another example was like um, tech guys in Saudi, right? Oh, were tech guys going to take Saudi money? Oh, now we're going to be so outraged about this one guy, Khashoggi. Do you know how many people the Saudi government, like th there, before MBS took power, the Saudi government was a lot nastier. They, they killed a lot more people, right? MBS is actually relatively, I mean, he has reformed the country. And so, it, you know, it's actually like, you know, it's similar to is how you hear so much more about Tiananmen than you do about the Cultural Revolution or Greatly Forward. Like yep. Cultural Revolution and Greatly Forward were far, 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 far worse. They killed millions and millions and millions of people, right? But um, while Tiananmen or, uh, you know, something like that is bad, it's bad. They're, they're not saying it's bad because it killed a lot of people. They're saying it's bad because they did something that the U.S. didn't want them to do. Um, whereas with the Cultural Revolution or the Great Leap Forward, that was just China churning in internal chaos. It was not actually um, going to be a threat to the U.S. Now with this, uh, you know, the, the Tiananmen thing, that was something where uh, they, they were quote, anti-democracy, so they weren't flipping over to the U.S. column. They were the only country that didn't really do that in that, like, 89 to 91 kind of era. Again, that's not to say that, you know, what the Chinese did during Tiananmen was good or anything like that. Of course, it's bad. What I'm saying, though, is basically that 
uh, the incidents that are that you hear about are those that are favorable to the U.S. establishment. Another example, Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Did you know uh, in Russia in 1993 that Yeltsin shelled his own White House? No. Yeah, exactly. That's an attack on democracy, literally. Okay. <laughs> but you didn't hear about it. That's, not, that's nowhere near as well known as Tiananmen. I don't know, one ten thousandth the coverage, okay? Because the U.S. was backing Yeltsin during that period, and they weren't backing Deng Xiaoping or Jiang Zemin in China, right? So if the U.S. is backing you when they were backing Saudi, all of those crimes that the Saudi, I mean, the 19 hijackers were Saudi. Like, all of that got swept under the rug. There was nothing there. Oh, you invade in Iraq and said. Once MBS turned against, you know, the U.S. or wasn't fully with them, then anything he does is magnified or what have you, right? Again, this is not to say that one is good or bad. It's just to say that the magnification changes depending on whether it's in the interest of the session. All right. I know I'm digressing, but I just talk straight. So I expect you to just kind of interrupt or whatever. But why, why no, don't you go? Right. This is the yeah. way I like to do it. Just let you run. No, but I completely okay. agree. The selective spotlighting of things that are beneficial to the narrative. And the one thing I could think of when you're going on that monologue was like, this is dangerous for our democracy. Like how uh, there's no like direct orders. It's just like a, a light nudging of propaganda that gets put into people's minds. And then. Yeah. So, so on this, on, on the whole, you know, j just, just to deconstruct that for a second, there's several ways that one can, you know, because this word democracy is, um, it's like Christianity or communism, where it can mean both like X and its opposite. Okay. For example, with Christianity, Christianity, and I'm not, I'm not anti-Christian or anything like that. I'm sure there's some listeners who are atheists, some are religious Christians, no offense is intended by what I'm about to say. Okay. Christianity at the time of the Romans was like the revolutionary religion that tore down the Roman empire, right? Said, you know, a rich man will sooner go through an eye of a needle than, you know, get to heaven. And, you know, like basically it was just a revolutionary thing that was, that was about, uh, you know, the last shall be first and the first shall be last and tore down the Roman empire. And then several hundred years later, Christianity served as the basis for, and I know it's not a direct successor, but a spiritual, or at least they styled themselves a successor, the Holy Roman empire. And then it became the basis for Christian Kings and it became the basis for order. And it became like exactly the opposite of what it was. It was now an ideology that supported the establishment as opposed to being dedicated to overthrowing it, right? Similarly with communism, communism was a revolutionary ideology that tore down the establishment, killed all the landowners and so on. But now, for example, in China, do you know what they call the descendants of senior Communist Party um, revolutionaries? No. Princelings. Hmm. Okay, so just like like the Christian king, right, that revolutionary ideology became a ruling class ideology, like when you win, you become the king. And now all the same slogans are used to justify a hierarchical rule. And so, you know, one of the most bizarre things is this revolutionary ide ideology that Karl Marx, you know, dreamed up in, you know, Central Europe, is, that, that hammer and sickle, where is it flying proudly in the South China Sea? 10,000 miles away <laughs> by somebody speaking a foreign language on a Chinese warship, right? When you just think about how far that's, right, that, that moved from, from 1848 to, to, you know, it's amazing the medic evolution, right? It became, became essentially its opposite from this revolutionary ideology to essentially a, an ideology that justifies Chinese nationalism, you know? And so the same with democracy, right? Basically, there's like several different, you know, angles you can have on this. The first is um, that today democracy in practice means rule by American Democrats. Okay. Yes. Why? Because if you vote for a Republican, you must hate democracy. Yeah, you're a white supremacist. Well, uh, right. But, and, and, and a fun thing you can try is, um, oh, I am for democracy. I am, uh, I am so for democracy. I will only vote for Democrats because the other parties against democracy. So, uh, you'll never vote for a Republican because they're against democracy. So you need to build a one party state because that's the essence of democracy. Okay. So if you, if you think about that, that's an epistemic loop where essentially they have gotten themselves into believing that a one party state without Republicans is how they protect democracy. Okay. <laughs> So that's, let's call that one observation. And what's funny about this is 
you can actually get them in an interesting loop where you say, would you ever vote for a Republican? They'll say no. Why? Oh, because Republicans are against democracy. Okay, so democracy means a one-party state. And they actually kind of can't choose either, right? They kind of want one-party Democrat. And what that means, by the way, in practice is California. It means one-party Democrat blue states. Okay. There's a second interpretation. And uh, what that is is basically um, that everything that Blue Tribe does is democracy. So if they sanction you, if they deplatform you, censor you, surveil you, even invade you, color revolution you, whatever, that is protecting democracy. But if you win an election that they don't like, that is an attack on democracy. Yeah. Okay, it's... whether it's Orban, whether it's Trump, whether it's DeSantis, whether it's Modi, whether it's, uh, you know, it could be on the left too. It could be, uh, you know, like Maduro or something like that. I mean, does he win an election? If he's a rigged election, right? Point Bolsonaro, is, Bolsonaro, you can. Bolsonaro, exactly. So they have a window which they define as, quote, democracy, and then anything outside that is an attack on democracy, it's democratic backsliding and so on, okay? Here's a third definition, which is, quote, democracy means U.S. military ally. Because it's very difficult to find a country that has high ratings for, quote, democracy that doesn't have a U.S. military base there. For example, Germany, Japan, South Korea, right? Like, essentially, a democracy usually has a U.S. military base or is like a former U.K. colony or something like that, right? If it's got high ratings for democracy. And that's a totally different filter on the world because... Obviously, you know, Japan, Germany, South Korea, these are like occupied countries with thousands and thousands and thousands of troops there, right? Um, the fourth definition is there's actually at least three democracies out there, or four. Um, there's blue democracy, there's red democracy, which is like Republicans. There is Indian democracy, which, I'll, which actually I think is going to be very, very important in the years to come. And there's like tech democracy, the democracy of exit and online voting and, and so on and so forth, right? And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I do think there is absolutely something to a free system where you should be able to choose and, and so on and so forth. And the exact weights of voice and exit and so on, TBD, but just like Christianity could be interpreted to mean both X and the opposite of X or, or Z, you know what I mean? Christianity is such a big word. Communism is such a big word. It can contain so many things. Capitalism, also a huge word. It can contain everything from the agrarian capitalism of the 1800s to the industrial capitalism of the 1900s to the tech capitalism of the 2000s, right? Democracy is a big word that can contain many interpretations. And what I think, what's, you know, just also, you know, beating up on the blues a little bit, I mean, just like the blues have concluded that what they actually mean by democracy is a one-party state, the reds have concluded the same thing. They want understandably, they're like, you know what, if this is tribal warfare, we're going to have one party Republican states. And so that's why, you know, a lot of the, I think a lot of the stuff on abortion, for example, is not so much on abortion, it's actually on immigration. You know why? It's because red states want to keep out blues from moving from blue states to red states if they aren't fully aligned culturally. So by passing these things that are shibboleths that will keep away some kind of blue, they are keeping Florida red or whatever, right? I think that's like, part, I've seen some people tweeting about that. I'm not sure, I don't know what percentage of the motivation there is. I'm not saying it's totally cynical or anything like that. But I think that's, that's part of it. I can confirm in Texas, I know people who won't move here because of the abortion laws. Right. And so, so if that's something that's, so what's happening is make America states again. You know, states are diverging. It's again, that thing about the decentralizing arc you know, the, the same kind of conflicts are happening, but in the opposite order. And the conflicts of the 1930s and the 1860s even, but in opposite order, and this time it's like a freedom revolution. Um, there's, there's another aspect, so I mentioned like four different kinds of blue democracy, red democracy, and red democracy is like Republicans at the state and local level passing these bills, building Republican strongholds and so on, right? Um, the third, Indian democracy, is worth noting. And the reason I note it is uh, again, with the like history of running and repeat filter, for most of the 20th century, Chinese communism was an also ran and a secondary note to the Soviet Marxist-Leninist variety. But what happened about 10 years before the collapse of the Soviet Union was that the Chinese started to do a more pragmatic version of communism. Right? 1978, Deng Xiaoping said, you know what? 
you know, it's a famous saying, black cat, white cat, doesn't matter if it catches mice. It's, it's trite, it's cliche, but it's, it's true that Deng turned around the entire country. Ezra Vogel has a great book on this, how China became, you know, capitalist. And so the, what happened was in 1989 to 91, the leading brand of communism totally face-planted. And most communist countries went to zero around the world. There's a few that were holdouts, like North Korea, Cuba, whatever. But most of them, once the funding from the Soviet Union was cut off, all the flags went down, all the trumpets stopped, right? The KGB guys, they weren't being paid anymore. All their psyops just went down like this, okay? And this, you know, the thing is, a regime never announces that it's going to die. It, you know, there's this great book called Everything Was Forever Till It Was No More. Mm -hmm. And it's basically about the last Soviet generation, where they, the system, they knew the system was collapsing, but it also seemed eternal at the same time. And it's worth reading, because the number of parallels to today, I'm going to come back to this point, the number of parallels today is bananas. I mean, down to like really small things, okay? Um, but my, just to return to this Indian democracy point, so Chinese communism took a pragmatic turn about 10 years before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it was a strong enough state to make its way through the choppy waters of 89 to 91 and make it through and come out the other side. And now, I'm not sure this is something you'd want, but it is the, quote, leading brand of communism. Right? In the mm -hmm. sense of, like, it, you know, like Russia is now the junior partner and, and so on and so forth. Okay? And Vietnam is also ostensibly communist. And there's, there's only a few communist states like it's China, Vietnam, um, North Korea, Cuba. I forget, the, I forget the other one. There's one other one I'm forgetting. Maybe it's Laos. Or, I forget the other one. Um, so I think it's five. Um, I'm going to look it up. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, but it's... yeah, Laos, right? So, okay, fine. So the uh, point is that um, China's, quote, the leading brand of communism, right? They're not exporting their system, but they're the leading brand. So I have a feeling that in the same way that like the Chinese became pragmatic about 10 years before the collapse of the Soviet Union, okay, the Indians have a pragmatic version of democracy where they can build. And they took that turn about 10 years ago. Like just to give, uh, do, there's something I tweeted recently, which is, and, and by the way, I say this, look, yes, I'm of Indian ancestry, but I've never been like a huge, I, 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 I like to think I call them as I see them, okay? It's like, you know, somebody who's born an Italian-American and they go back home, they're like, whoa, Italy is executing, you know, Italy's buildings, if Italy was doing that. That's kind of the, that, that's a framework that I'm going into this with, okay? The first, you know, uh, I don't know, 30 something years of my life, I'm, I'm, I'm like 43 now, okay? But the first 30 years of my life, I mean, I, 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 like a, being Indian was like, again, being like um, John Salvatore or whatever. You're just like, it's just like a last name. It wasn't like something that I paid a huge amount of attention to, to the old world. You know, it was just in tech. I'm doing math, doing all that type of stuff. But over the last 10 years, and especially like the last five, I was shocked by how well India was executing. Like, it's, if, it, it's hard to, you know, the thing is, you can only really sense this if you've gone back every few years and you've kind of seen what it is, right? And then you just see, it's kind of like San Francisco, but in reverse. You know how San Francisco was like this beautiful city and just became a complete shithole, right? Um, and it didn't have to be that way, but lots of blue cities have decayed like this. I don't have to tell you this, you've seen it yourself, right? Yep. It's like that in reverse in India, okay? And that's not to say that it's like totally clean or anything like that, it's not, okay? But it's improved so much over the last 20 years, and especially the last 10 or the last five, that something really good is happening there. And just one way I can kind of put some numbers on it, like the new parliament building was built in two and a half years and cost 125 million. And you can see it, I tweeted about it, okay? You could, like, for a thousand X that amount of money, you, uh, like, it, I mean, for I think Salesforce Tower, how much was Salesforce Tower? Salesforce Tower was like 10 billion or something? How much did it cost? Um, okay, it was like multiple billions, okay? Uh, you know, the embassy in Hanoi by the U.S. is like 10x that cost, and it's just the embassy, and it's not, the, not a full parliament building. 
India, and India that can build is a completely new thing, or, or rather it's an old thing that is again new, right? Like, like India was, uh, I'm not saying this in a, oh, chest thumpy kind of way or whatever, but like, you know, Columbus in 1492, he wanted to get to India, right? That's what he called the American Indians. He thought they were Indians or whatever. Yeah. He wanted to trade with them, right? So in Europe, India was actually a big trade center that they wanted to trade with. It was thought of as something you'd want to go and seek out. So India was not, a, not in a, like, uh, chest up way, but it was a formidable player civilizationally for a long time. And then it was just, like, laid low for a long time. And so was China, laid low by the Opium Wars and whatnot. But now both of those two are just coming back with, like, about a 10-year delay. And India is just executing. And my, my point is that just like Chinese communism became, like, the leading brand of communism after the Soviet collapse— I think there's a chance that Indian democracy becomes the leading brand of democracy if we see a serious financial crisis in the West. And I think that's good because at the end of the day, I do think we need an alternative to Chinese communism because that's the thing. Like, I don't, I don't say, I mean, at the beginning, you know, when we talked about those graphs in China, I'm not a China triumphalist at all. There's some people who will go and show those graphs and be like, yay, China, and so on. I respect China. I fear China. I mean, fear, let's put it like that. Let's say I'm apprehensive about China, right? I'm not like, oh my God, like, you know, but like genuinely concerned about how powerful they are. They are not just going to go away. They execute really, really, really well. They're bleeding in cars. They've, they've just launched their own domestic plane competitor to Boeing and Airbus. They build more than anyone else in the world. And here's the thing. Right now, they are playing nice. That's the thing. They've learned to flex a diplomatic muscle. They, that's the thing they didn't have. You know, they were doing this wolf warrior stuff where they were yelling at everybody. They just learned how to flex a diplomatic muscle. And they, in a, once they just started playing nice, they rolled up Saudi, Iran, France, Brazil, all these guys all at once. They're the obvious alternative economic model. Here's the problem. Just like the U.S. was, you know, I think overall good from 1945 to 1991. But once the Soviet Union went away, the U.S. by degrees gradually became very nasty. Mm -hmm. You know, because there wasn't that constraint anymore. I'm not saying it's not that the Soviets were good. It's that their presence meant the U.S. basically, the U.S. played win-win, right? Ultimately, the justification for the U.S. from 1945 to 1991 is West Germany was better than East Germany. South Korea was better than North Korea. Hong Kong and Taiwan were better than the PRC. Uh, Chile was better than Cuba. And while the groups that the U.S. backed were not always nice. They were a lot nicer than the other side. You know, like, you know, you know what the term for left-wing death squads is? It's communists. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so left-wing death squads killed 100 million people in the 20th century. And fighting them off, while it wasn't always nice, was on balance better than the alternative. Right? Yeah. So on balance... You know, even though I was only alive for a portion of that, like I think America during the Cold War was on balance good. And then by degrees, it sort of lost its bearing. Maybe the 90s, you can argue, maybe Kosovo was like an early version of that, right? There were still good things the U.S. was doing during the 90s, in particular, it was helping the Eastern European countries get back on their feet. It was, you know, and, 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 and build them up economically. The, the win-win America that I think you and I both respect was still there. Right. Like that was still in evidence in the 90s and even the early 2000s. Um, but then after 9-11 uh, and Iraq and, uh, you know, it, it started to lose its way and now it's just completely lost its way. And so the thing is that without that constraint and, and now multipolarity is bringing the constraint back. OK, now here's a problem. Maybe multipolarity is only actually a transitional phase. Maybe if this fiat crisis is as serious as we think, maybe the U.S. is actually going to financially face plant. Like, yeah. just like SVB, just like these banks just go digitally to zero. When you've got financial wealth and it's all zeros on a printer, it can just go to zero. It's like yeah. much more like flaky than, than uh, the factories in China, right? So if that happens and if that face plant happens, we can talk about the mechanics of it, then, um, well... Uh, China's really strong in that world. It's a beast out of a cage. The Russian bear, the Chinese panda, boom, they escape all constraints. And everybody who is mean to them 
is going to get, you know, oh, shoot. Right. Come up. Because you know what? Go ahead. No, I was gonna say, it's just very frustrating because um, I do think Americans, particularly the establishment, is severely discounting the the strength that countries like China, India, and Russia are gathering right now. Again, going back to what we said in the beginning of the conversation, if you just take the names off the chart and look, energy production is what I think is the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, if you look at right. increased energy production in China, Russia, India, particularly they're exploding while we're shooting ourselves in the foot and putting in unreliable energy infrastructure. And then on top of that, again, the propaganda about like Chinese being communist and we'll never make it just like the nature of being in the Bitcoin mining industry. I've interacted with a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs and capitalists and they're arguably more capitalists than a lot of the people over here in America. And that's just, people don't like to admit it, but if you just look at the major manufacturers in Bitmain and MicroBT, they're two Chinese companies. Obviously, MicroBT's moved its headquarters, but it started in China. And they were arguably the most capitalist actors in the Bitcoin, the whole Bitcoin economy. I mean, the ASIC industry they spun up themselves is one of the most impressive things that's happened in the last two decades. And people just don't want yeah. to acknowledge that. I, that's the thing is, like, you know, so let me show something here. And, and first of all, you're absolutely right. Um, you just, e even if it's a rival, especially if it's a rival, you have to respect them in the sense of you need to actually have, you know, the greatest strength is to know one's own weakness. Like the USA did not win, the USA of mid-century did not win the Cold War by saying the Ruskies suck, they'll never do anything. When the Ruskies were out, when the Ruskies, when the Soviets were out executing the US during Sputnik, the answer wasn't, no, we've got the great Mississippi River, right? Instead, JFK pushed, um, you know, the, the moon landing, right? There was the admission that the other guys had gotten ahead, and there was the redoubling of effort and dedication to get back ahead, right? That's actually, it's not denial. It's not like, oh, well, we're a democracy, and we've got the Mississippi River, therefore we're going to win. That's stupid. You know, like lots of countries have rivers. The reason I say this is all the geography stuff. So to your point on the energy thing, uh, so do you see my the slide that I kind of put up here? Yep. Yeah. So someone was like, I'd like to hear Balaji's rebuttal to uh, Zion's main pillar is bear thesis, 100% reliant on the U.S.-led world order. If that is true, China cannot secure their own energy, you know, you right? And it's like, it's just totally false because PG&E is doing rolling blackouts and China is scaling nuclear right? To your point on energy. And then someone was like, oh, China also had a blackout or whatever. And I'm like, okay, fine. Why don't we look at the graphs, right? This is electricity production by source in the US. Do you see that graph? Yep. It's and this is what falling. it looks like. This is what it looks like in China. Obviously, like, you know, one news report is not the same as like the, the growth where it's now at 7,000 terawatt hours and, and growing, right? Um, and this is what it looks like for India as well. Uh, not, not like this, but more like this. Okay. And so, um, you know, the, the issue is with all of this stuff that, uh, people, you know, it's like they are in, it's, it's a difference between founding and inheriting, you know, if you've built something right. Um, and you know, you built the TFTC podcast and you know, a, a bunch of entrepreneurs and have you, are you also an investor? Yes. Or do, okay, great. So you're close to entrepreneurs. You know, I, I, you know, I was, I was both the founder. I've been a founder. I've been an investor and whatnot. It's really hard to build something, right? And the difference between somebody who's founded something and someone who's just inherited something is the difference between the men who built America, who didn't take anything for granted, who were not, did not think number one was their birthright, and they built it up from scratch versus, you know, I, I don't think everybody but a lot of the effete children of empire that inherited the superpower. And it's like taking a McLaren or whatever and running it into the ground, you know, like the, to mix metaphors. Okay. I know you're and a whatever, McLaren's a car. Okay. If I'm running into the wall, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Um, yep. Cause you know, in 1991, the USA was a hyperpower that won everywhere without fighting. And by 2021, it fights everywhere without winning. 
like the decline in 30 years is very, very, very dramatic. And, you know, what could they have done differently, right? Um, I'm not sure they could actually have, I think it's stupid to say, oh, you could have held back China. I don't think you could because they just execute incredibly well. I mean, what I, what I, at least domestically, what they definitely could have done is the establishment could have essentially taken stakes in tech and not fought tech tooth and nail. It could have taken a more win-win posture versus conservatives and not alienated its entire police and military, right? And, um, but instead, it, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, did that, right? So it's alienated its tech guys and its conservatives, and they're different, right? They're overlapping, but they're not the same. Um, it's alienated its tech guys and its conservatives domestically, and uh, it also has fought guys globally, and so it doesn't have any home base beyond, like, Brooklyn or whatever, you know? <laughs> And, he, and even then, those people are all stabbing each other, right? Yeah. Um, so, oh my gosh, was, oh, one thing I, you know, one point I made, I want to kind of actually talk about this analogy for a second in a more depth. So, you know, I talked about like the fall of the USSR and I mentioned the USSA, okay? Now, woke America is to America as Soviet Russia is to Russia. Like there were, you know, Russians were, in many ways, the greatest victims of the Soviet regime. You know, easily. it was this, right? Go ahead. Yeah. No, easily. And, I mean, objectively. Well, they were. It's, it's complicated because they were also turned by the Soviet regime into victimizers. And they're, you know, like Russians were used to invade Estonia and all these other places and impose locally, right? And so... It's very complicated, and even now today, there's a lot of Russians who pine for the time when they were big and strong under Stalin, you know, even if he killed lots of them or whatever, right? So it's, it's very complicated thing, the difference between like a country and like this globe-spanning empire. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you ever seen Venom? The yeah. movie Venom, or right? You know the Venom symbiote? How it like powers you up, but it like devours you from within, mm -hmm. right? That's what like empire is. Okay, in a sense, it took Russia from just a country in Europe to the Soviet Union, right? Like the venom symbiote version of itself, which had propaganda appeal everywhere and could launch nuclear weapons and had satellites and conquered all these people around it. It gave it gave like the Russian superpowers because it gave them ideology. But it devoured them from within and it left them like a shell of their former self when the whole thing left. And then they had hyperinflation and they had all this chaos and they had states break away. And then they, they had like, have you seen the post-Soviet conflicts? Have you seen that Wikipedia list? No. There's like 30 post-Soviet conflicts. It's like the Tajikistan civil war or whatever. Okay. There's like a ton of these things. Right. And everybody's just like shooting each other in the post-Soviet atmosphere. And the U S is just looking over to make sure the nukes aren't flying around. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, the point is that basically um, that's kind of what I think of the USSA is like, right? Like woke America is to America, Soviet Russia is to Russia means like the current regime oppresses the average American and they're in many ways one of the biggest victims of the regime, but they're also turned by the regime into victimizer, especially abroad. You know, lots of people in the Middle East, lots of people abroad, you know, they, their only encounter is with either uh, the Pentagon or the State Department. And it's either at gunpoint telling you to do something or it is, you know, imposing sanctions and this and that very high handed. Like the rest of the world has seen the pointy end of, you know, what, what the U.S. establishment is. And now you're seeing some of that coming back because they've got voices online. They're like, no, I don't want to be bossed around like this anymore. Right. Um. And it's not so much like, it's very complicated because just like the Soviet case, there was also, uh, you know, look, I'm as anti-communist as they come, all right, but it is, it is empirically true that the Soviet Union did have massive technical accomplishments during the 20th century, like from Sputnik to, you know, some of their scientists and mathematicians were like absolutely world-class. Uh, it's, it's, it's just complicated like any giant empire is, right? And I think the U.S. delivered a much better life for its people over that time period. And so it was the better of the two by far. But now at the end of empire, 
uh, we've got a situation where the parallels to the USSR are actually, there's a lot. Let me go through them. So first is both had a chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, okay? Both of them have something where there's crashing life expectancy for men, <laughs> right? Deaths of despair due to, you know, drug overdoses and things like that, okay? Uh, both of them have had basically about 10 years of massive internal conflict and confrontation with a very powerful outside superpower, okay? Um, both have a, a guy who took office who um, essentially overturned decades and decades of policy and sets Gorbachev and Trump, okay? Um, both of those were totally resisted by the establishment. In fact, six years after uh, Gorbachev took office, there was um, a, a coup against him by the communist hardliners. And it's, you know, arguably like uh, whether you, you know, whatever you call Jan 6, it's like that, but in reverse, okay? <laughs> um, and um, also 1985 and, you know, 2015, one of the things Gorbachev did is he allowed Glasnost and Perestroika. And Glasnost was truly free speech and Perestroika was more free markets, right? And he thought that this would like gradually reform the Soviet Union, but actually it unleashed these forces that led to the collapse because once people had freedom of speech, the, they could start talking about all these things the regime had done and all these secrets that bubbled up. And then free markets started to show how terrible the actual standard of living was. In, in the US, we have digital glasnost, which is uncensored social media. And we have digital perestroika, which is Bitcoin and truly free markets. And so for the first time, actually in generations, we have truly free speech in the West. And why did we not have it? It's less obvious in the Soviet Union where they actually put photocopiers under padlock. But until very recently, you essentially had to inherit a newspaper to be able to get your word out. You know, you had, you, you had the freedom of speech to go and talk to your next door neighbor or something like that. But actually go and broadcast, you need a radio license or a TV license or inherit a newspaper or something like that. So you had, uh, you didn't have practical, you didn't have freedom of reach. You couldn't easily build up reach, right? It's very capital intensive until basically about the last 10 years. And after an offensive and a counter offensive and so on with the lawn getting Twitter and now we've got multiple decentralized social networks with Jack, with Noster and there's Farcaster, there's Blue Sky and whatnot. It looks like we actually have digital glasnost and true freedom of speech on the internet. And, you know, the battle for Bitcoin, that's still to come. Obviously, you and I think about that a lot. But as you're aware, just like we didn't have truly free speech in, in the U.S., we didn't have truly free markets because gold seizures, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing people think, by the way, is just like the Fed has been gaming, you know, the plunge protection team has actually admitted they're gaming the market, right? And people suspect they're gaming the VIX. People also suspect they've been gaming the gold price with like puts and stuff like that. But now central bankers outside the West buying physical gold seems to be driving that up. Luke Roman is the expert on this. I'm not like a gold expert, but he's talked about this, okay? But now with Bitcoin, we actually have truly free markets. And since the introduction of Bitcoin, as you know, if you look at USD BTC, I think uh, Bitstein, you know, Michael, Michael, uh, Michael Bitstein? Goldstein, yeah. I know he calls himself Bitstein on Twitter, right? Um, so I, I like him. Uh, but he sometimes posts this graph showing the US dollar collapsing against Bitcoin. Because it's lost six, seven orders of magnitude, you know, from, from one cent to $10,000, okay? One order gets you 0.1, two gets you $1, right? Three gets you 10, four gets you 100, five gets you 1,000, six gets you um, 10,000, right? So. The U.S. dollar, the smart money has actually been, once Bitcoin is out there, I, here, here's a graph I'm talking about. Um, that's, well, go ahead. while you're pulling the graph up too, that's like one thing I wonder, like with the internet, truly free speech and truly free money and free markets, is this manifestation of this version of free speech and free markets more powerful than the free speech and free markets that were unleashed in the, the the Soviet era. I think they are. I think it is actually. And I think also it is, it's not, so here's, here's a graph that I was talking about. Um, oops, so it's BTC USD. I want the opposite. I want, um, 
I want to do that. Ah, there we go. There we go. Okay. Since the inception of Bitcoin, the dollar has been collapsing against Bitcoin. Right? Yeah. It's got, it's got a couple more, ac- more orders of magnitude to go, too, I would say. And it's almost invisible on the chart, but it'll be highly visible in real life. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's just a funny way of thinking about it, that the alter- once people had truly free markets introduced, they started opting into them. And all of these bumps and stuff that were so dramatic for us, like this is an enormous vote of no confidence against uh, the Fed, which I'll come back to. So going back to that, you know, analogy, right? So there's Afghanistan, there's a life expectancy drop, there's the Gorbachev Trump parallel overturning decades of policy, there's Glasnost and there's Perestroika. But it even goes down to smaller things. For example, once there was Glasnost, you had subcultures forming within the Soviet Union that weren't necessarily opposed to the mainstream, but they weren't aligned with it either. Okay? Like, that's to say, you know, this was an unusual thing for a Soviet Union that for decades had been so centralized. Okay? Now you had cultures that were into, I don't know, rock and roll or something like that, right? And uh, rock and roll was American coded, but there are other things that were not Soviet coded. And um, that's similar to the internet subcultures that have arisen that are not necessarily anti-regime, but they're not like explicitly pro-regime either. They're their own thing. So they sort of hollow out the total alignment of the 1950s, you know, with the state, if that makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even more than that, like the Soviets had a word that is very similar to our, our term clown world. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Like I'll find this term. It's in this book. Everything was forever till it was no more. Okay. Here's, here's the book. Um, here, uh, let me find it. Their clown world word was probably much more beautiful than, uh... <laughs> well, it's, it's funny because it's like, they would joke about the absurdity of the contrast between like the official propaganda and, um, and then what was actually here. Let me see if I can show this to you. So this book, Everything Was Forever Until Is No More, The Last Soviet Generation, okay, is worth reading because um, the collapse, right, Soviet socialism, so the collapse seemed both completely unexpected and completely unsurprising. At the moment of collapse, it suddenly became obvious that Soviet life has always seemed simultaneously eternal and stagnating, vigorous and nearly bleak and full of promise, right? And it's it's because, you know, the, the Soviet Union didn't just like to just go down, you know, in one straight line, there was all kinds of thrashing and other kinds of things that they tried to do. Uh, just to just to kind of, uh, you know, discuss that a little bit more. Basically, um, there, you know, my, my thing about how history is running in reverse, but we're seeing like the opposite outcome, right? One of the big things that Gorbachev did was detente. Because for 40 years prior, the Soviet Union had been locked in this head-to-head with the USA and, you know, everything from the Cuban Missile Crisis to Vietnam all came out of that. And Gorbachev cooled that down. Trump actually did the opposite. Why? For 40 years-ish prior to uh, Trump taking office, the U.S. had been in detente with China. And Trump escalated it. Right? So Gorbachev took escalation to detente. Trump took detente to escalation. Now, you might say that's good or bad, right? But basically... It was very counterintuitive at that time for Gorbachev to de-escalate with the hereditary enemy, the USA, and it was very counterintuitive at that time. You remember in 2015, when Trump was saying, China, 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 mm-hmm. everybody was making fun of him. That was an extremely non-consensus thing. You had to be a, a, you know, a working class guy to care about China. Why did you care about China? Are you a racist or whatever, right? That was absolutely the attitude in 2015. If you just warped back, it wasn't that long ago, you know? And even as late as like 2016, um, you know, I, I found this. Here's just like an article just to show you like the, the temperature at that time. Um, nobody, nobody cared about China. Nobody cared about Taiwan. OK, let me show you. All right. Just just a few years ago. Right here. This is um, 2016. OK, um, the uh, uh, you can you can Google the headline, but basically this is from December 2nd, 2016, and there's other headlines around the time. Trump speaks with Taiwan's leader and affront to China. Okay? 
Here's a quote. Among diplomats in the United States, there's a similar shock. This is a change of historic proportions. The real question is, what are the Chinese going to do? Okay. So as late as 2016, NYT was upbraiding Trump for talking to Taiwan, angering China. That was mainstream sentiment back then. This is not that long ago. You with me so far? Yep. And if you go back even a, further, a few more years, okay, here, 2011, to save our economy, ditch Taiwan. <laughs> okay. Write off $1 trillion of U.S. debt in exchange for a deal. You know what? Like, this is actually uh, the kind of hard-headed real politic that should be on the table as a consideration rather than, you know, look, after you've just burned $8 trillion in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, maybe avoid a giant war and have a peace and some treaty or whatever where you can get chips and, you know, so on. I'm not saying it's like the ideal outcome. I'm saying, though, that the U.S. was... Uh, in detente with China at that time. And then they went to escalation after 2015 with Trump, right? But it, the, the parallels go even deeper. It's like, uh, you know, one big thing towards the end of the Soviet Union is a huge portion of their youth were actually obsessed with foreign culture, right? Blue mm -hmm. jeans and rock and roll, okay? Now here's the twist. Actually, a huge portion of American youth are into Chinese culture. You know why? Mm. TikTok or exactly TikTok. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Like TikTok can't be banned or whatever. That's too popular among the youth. Yeah. That it's TikTok, not like K-pop is big too. K-pop. Exactly. Foreign influences in general. This is the thing. Like the whole Russiagate thing is actually, actually part of a broader thing, which is that for the first time, you know, uh, the, the U S has gone from the coolest country in the world to the holiest country in the world. Okay, holier what I mean by thou. that is exactly holier than thou. Like when you and I were growing up, I mean, th just think about like, okay, not to pick on it, like Jimmy Kimmel, okay? His transformation from being the joker of the man show to this woke <laughs> Wearing skull. blackface. And yeah. All this, you know, <laughs> not only blackface, he, 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 uh, he painted up his whole body. To imitate oh, yeah, and he there. made fun of Carl Malone and all this. Right, so, so Jimmy Kimmel was like a boorish, you know, clown. I mean, whatever, that was his persona, okay? Beer and tits was the show. The exactly, show. right? Yeah. Or, or you know, Jon Stewart uh, was uh, very un-PC for today back then. And, um, you know, all of them have become essentially extremely holy. Uh, or Jim Carrey, another great example, right? All these guys who are funny men have become holy men, which is a non-obvious thing. You know, it's a non-obvious transition to go from irreverent body humor to totally worshiping the state, right? It's like not, you would not think that those two things connected in like ideology space, but somehow that happened. And I think where it happened is these are people who want very high status and are good at getting it and are great actors. And as that changed into like this neo-state religion, um, they, they just changed to that, right? But what that left open was true comedy. And so Dave Chappelle and others have kind of taken that kind of role, right? Uh, but it also left open coolness and interesting things. And, you know, the, like you can argue, it may be a little different than cool, but SpaceX is wow. You know, rockets taking off, like the, the cool stuff, AI, I think that's cool. Maybe you call that wow, uh, you know, like cool versus wow. It's cool is like, you know, the turning of the head and wow is like, ah, oh, jaw drop. It's kind of a different thing, right? But they have left that domain open where there's people who are doing cool things, people doing wow things, and it's no longer, you know, the, the NPC is just saying what NYT is, is uh, saying is not ni neither of those things, right? But actually, I'll give you a puzzle, all right? The biggest, here, here is the biggest riddle, and for me at least, it's a skeleton key that explains a lot of the last eight years. Towards the end of the Soviet Union, the USSR was copying the USA. And one of the reasons it failed is because it changed from we are going to build communism to uh, we're going to be like a shitty USA. Okay, we're going to be like a crappy clone of the USA. Okay, and that was everything from, you know, Gorbachev trying to have free speech and free markets to allowing blue jeans to, you know, to, to like loosening up. Right. Here's my question to you. What country is the U.S. copying? I mean, 
If we're really going down like the CBDC route, it would be China, right? Exactly. Exactly. This is the non-obvious clue to the last eight years. Republicans, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this as like a diss on any particular group. I'm just saying it's a different lens in the last eight years. Republicans are rejecting free markets to go to industrial policy, economic nationalism, tariffs, trade war, all this type of stuff, because they think China is a competition. They're going to out China, China. Democrats have rejected free speech. There's literally articles saying, um, here, I'll just show you, just to show you one. Um, China, th these guys saying China was right in the Atlantic. Yeah. Yeah, China's actually doing something good by curbing speech. <laughs> You should have more That's control like, over the money. Yeah, here, hold on, look. See, these guys. In the Atlantic, there. Internet speech will never go back to normal. In a debate over freedom versus control of the global network, China was largely correct and the U.S. is wrong. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's in the Atlantic. That's, that's an explicit statement. Okay? And, um, you know, often you'll see it said implicitly, but basically uh, the things that, you know, made the U.S. the U.S. And even if it was not fully free speech and free markets, um, those principles were rejected, right? The, the right rejected free markets to go to this trade war, economic nationalism, chest thumping kind of thing. And, and by the way, like I'm not saying that you can't do trade policy well, okay? I think you, you can, but it's hard to do it well. And simply doing it doesn't mean you're doing it well, okay? And let me come back to it. It's kind of like once the Soviet Union decided to do capitalism, it did it in a terrible way because there's a graft and retrofit on top of a, the system that wasn't built for that. You know, um, industrial policy is like venture capital. It's really hard to do profit. It's possible, but hard to do profit. OK. Similarly, when the Democrats were trying to do speech control, censorship, cancellation, deplatforming, you know, even cancellation has its origins in China. You know what it's called there? Human flesh search. Have you heard that before? Not human flesh search, but... I do remember the dunce caps from the yeah the cultural revolution the cultural revolution yeah, yeah. you know the, the parallels you know i observed this actually years and years ago here i'm going to show you this um so years ago i was just observing this like basically um you see this wechat users block from sending 6489 or 8964 right june 5th 2018 do you see that mm -hmm. okay Facebook scrubs any mentions of Sierra Mella, <laughs> right? So yeah. basically, um, when you send politically sensitive stuff on WeChat, they censor. When you send politically sensitive stuff on Facebook, they censor, right? This is a three or four years ago. And I was observing it then. Neither side wants to admit, but the U.S. and China are converging in some weird ways. Internet social censorship, nationalism and socialism, state takeover of tech companies, Okay, social credit and cancel culture. And cancel culture is just a decentralized social credit score. You know? Yep. Um, and then human flesh search is the Chinese thing for Twitter mobs. Okay? And this was November 2019. Now, you know what happened just a few months later? The ultimate uh, copying of co China. Yeah. COVID yeah, lockdowns, lockdowns. All that. Ex yeah. Exactly, right? So, which is a bipartisan copying of China. And the thing is, early on, by the way, you know, it is true that in the past, quarantines by a well-functioning state have at times been used to control the spread of disease. Didn't work for COVID. You know, that's a whole kind of separate discussion. But the, the point is that on a variety of issues, as we've just gone through, from rejection of free markets to rejection of free speech to the CBDC to uh, um, the uh, speech controls to thought controls to cancellation, all this kind of stuff, the U.S. has been copying China. It's a bipartisan thing. And it's not admitted. Okay? It, go ahead. Well, I, I think it's not admitted by the establishment, but I think people like us, Bitcoiners particularly recognize, and that's why they focus on Bitcoin. It's like, hey, we're going to get China here with the social credit score if we don't figure out Bitcoin. True. But, I, but I'd say that the full scope of it, um, I, I think people will sometimes see one piece of it or another. They'll see... It's a CBDC, okay? Or they'll see it's um, a cultural revolution or... Yeah, like yeah. For, for example, Republicans will see the Democrat incursion on free speech. And they'll say, you don't want to be like China there. But then many of them will support industrial policy. And that's like also, you know, to compete with China, we need to do this, right? 
And, uh, you know, actually, you know, another big example, you know, something else that the U.S. didn't care about at all. Uh, you know, you know, Peter Thiel's concept of mimetic rivalry. Mm -hmm. Right. So something, you know, what the U.S. didn't care about at all for years and years and years. Taiwan. <laughs> right. OK, as I just showed just a few minutes ago in 2011, The New York Times ran an op ed saying sell Taiwan to China for for giving the debt. OK, that is how little it's like Kazakhstan or something. OK, well, no. Nope. And similarly about Ukraine, like you had all the uh, there, there's that picture going off the juxtaposition of the different headlines in the same newspapers like three years apart. Like Ukraine was an untouchable. Oh, corrupt. corrupt. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, even better is. Who cared about the invasion of Crimea in 2014? Like, we were all online then. Do you even remember that? Like, that no. was like a one-day headline at most, right? Nobody cared about the invasion of Crimea in 2014. Um, that's a whole separate thing. You know, like, McCain and others started arming up, you know, Ukrainians after that. It became like a whole cause to kind of... But the point is that on all of these different issues, on uh, the U.S. has been copying China over the last eight years, and it's been copying them in a bad way. It's not like the U.S. is not going to be a better China than China. It's not going to be better at trade war. It's not going to be better at tariffs, economic nationalism, surveillance, building a censorship state, doing a CBDC, doing lockdowns, infringing on civil. It's not going to be better at those things because that's not the soul of what it is. That's not the soul of the country. That's not the soul of the people. Right. It's a free people. And uh, so um, that's that's like a. It's kind of like trying to graft the USA onto the USSR. Um, it's going to—it's causing a collapse. I mean, one of the reasons you know how like the uh, arms race was part of the reason the Soviet Union collapsed, right? All of this industrial policy that is happening now, you know, the, the amounts that are being allocated are like hundreds of billions of dollars in some cases, and it's not—it's—it's uh, it's all being spent in the same way that the. $300 million bus lane in San Francisco or the, 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 the $50,000 bus stop, you know, like all of these things are just wildly, wildly, wildly over cost there. It's like legal graft. You're just employing a hundred X the number of people or, or, uh, environmental consultants or whatever on the project. But it's like the late Soviet union where it's so inefficient that it cannot compete. And when you look at, have you seen those videos I post about like how fast China builds stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. They can build so, a whole bridge and overnight a whole highway. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, it's like here, it's like, uh, the eight hours. Oh, why are you looking this up? I do want to go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We've got a bunch of other stuff to talk about. I know we've been well, that was like, but... what it like, what is the soul of America? Like, how do you think we should be competing? I'll tell you my thoughts in a second. So uh, for what it's worth, basically, China builds a train station in nine hours. California can't build a bus shelter. Because so like they're actually saying typical bus shelters often cost 50K or more and require coordination among eight departments. OK, these are the guys who are defending their thing. OK, this L.A. nonprofit bus shelters cost $50,000 or more and require coordination among eight departments to build a freaking bus shelter. <laughs> right. And. Essentially, what they're saying is the regulations are so arcane that a government-funded nonprofit working with a government has to do regulatory arbitrage to get around the other agencies. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Now, but now there's actually a good to that. You know why? The good is red tape usually prevents other people from doing things, but at a certain point, the red tape ties up the organization itself and prevents it from preventing people from doing things. <laughs> okay. no, this reminds me, I'm sure you've seen it too, the meme of there was an individual who built like a staircase at the park across the street from him. And then the government came and tore it down. It's, he built it for like 60 bucks and they came tore it down and built a staircase that cost like $80,000 or something like that. Oh, really? I hadn't seen that, but that's it a perfect like example. Six months. That's a perfect example. Exactly. Right. And by the way, that gets to a deep point, which is like the, the ability is here's a, here's this example. You can watch this video, trying to build a transition in nine hours. They just go through whoosh like this, have all these guys team up and it gets done overnight. Right. Um, 
that's just, that's not like 10% better. That's just a completely different culture. That is something where they have been, it's like people will hearken back to when America did manufacturing, but it's like a 75 year old guy thinking back to when he was 25 and thinking he can just walk over to the bench press and knock out 225 for reps. <laughs> and you know what? You at least need some warm ups. Even if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, like you're not going to have the strength you did at 25. And this is like an old regime now, you know? It needs to like regain strength gradually. It took China 45 years of working out every day to build up the muscle tone that it has now in terms of building stuff. You're not going to be able to just regain that overnight. Plus, they did hide your strength and bide your time the whole time. By the way, your point on the staircase is actually very deep because, um, so, and it relates to the rebirth of America, um, which is because history is running in reverse, um, I do think that there is going to be a uh, serious clash with the federal government in the years to come, maybe months to come, who the hell knows. Um, and here's one sci-fi scenario, okay? Sci-fi scenario. The sci-fi scenario is um, that the red states and Western, so it, you know, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Baltic states and the Eastern European satellites did better on their own when they left the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, the red states and the Western European satellites of the US uh, uh, empire will probably do better off on their own. France is already trying to break away, right? Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, all these states are already breaking away from the federal government, you know, make America states again. That's already happening. You've got divergence on gun laws, abortion laws, immigration laws, um, you know, it's sanctuary cities, but in reverse. And actually blue states are also going further blue. You know, they are going uh, without a federal thing to kind of do dispute resolution, states are rapidly diverging on policy. And in fact, even during 2020, um, COVID was like a preview of what is to come because in early COVID, I don't know if you remember this, do you remember the interstate compacts? Mm, no. It's actually something that exists in the uh, Constitution, but because the federal government was like MIA in uh, early COVID, like in a true national emergency, okay, um, here, like the state capacity just wasn't there. Um, so here we are, interstate compacts, right? So. California, Oregon, and Washington announce Western States Pact. Massachusetts joins New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Delaware, multi-state council. Minnesota government, uh, Governor Tim Walz joins compact with Midwest governors to reopen economy, joining six other members to, co to collaborate, right? So the chaotic onset of COVID, when the states just had to fend for themselves, was like a dress rehearsal for like governors to start like becoming actual governors. Yep. Okay. And, you know, there are other things as well where there were like state checkpoints and so on. I, I think 2020 is like a trial run for what is to come. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, this is actually, this is an article from 2018 that talks about interstate compacts and it actually uh, predicted them before they were used in 2020. Okay. Um, and, you know, divided we stand, the country's hopelessly split. So interstate compacts, you know, she actually noted them before they were even used by the government. Okay. So, and states had hard borders during COVID. Like you couldn't get from, you couldn't get into Florida without like a, I forget what it was, whether it was um, 14 days of quarantine or something like states had various rules like that, if you remember that, right? All that I think is a dress rehearsal for what's coming, which is, um, as we're seeing, fortunately there are Democrats who are pro Bitcoin and more generally pro cryptocurrency. It's like, Eric Adams is pro Bitcoin and Jared Police is pro Bitcoin and Ro Khanna is pro Bitcoin. So it's not like purely partisan, which is good. Um, DeSant, you know, uh, RFK Jr. is pro Bitcoin. Uh, but on the right, you have Vivek and you have um, Ron DeSantis and you have um, many governors who have come out as pro Bitcoin, right? And then you have on the other side, you have Elizabeth Warren and others who are you know, uh, anti, right? Her anti-crypto army. And so as opposed to exactly left versus right, um, have you seen my thing on dollar nationalist versus Bitcoin maximalist? 
It's like no. Essentially, I think I have read um, that one yet. So here, that's the other tribe. <laughs> um, they're on the uh, the losing side. Well, I mean, here's the thing: something is big. It's like it's like the Roman Empire. Something. Sometimes something really big doesn't just totally go to zero. It has some successor state, you know, like the Soviet Union had Russia, right? Um, Roman Empire had the Byzantines. Uh, so, so basically, today is red versus blue. Tomorrow will be orange versus green. Bitcoin maximalist versus dollar nationalist. The decentralized network versus the centralized state. Okay. So today you have, um, if I if I do the you know, look at the initial frame of this, so today it looks like. Uh, this right you know have you seen the political compass before yep yeah so this is like the right and this is the left and you know this is left authoritarian left libertarian right authoritarian right libertarian okay tomorrow um looks like something maybe like this and that's like rfk jr okay mm -hmm. and this is like you know you can argue where desantis fits you know but um Certainly a lot of maximalists are, you know, arguably over here. Some are over here, the, you know, and then you have uh, like Elizabeth Warren types are up over here, but actually there's a fair number of like Republican militarists slash authoritarians who will at the end of the day side with the dollar over Bitcoin. It's a non-zero number. Trump right? might be one of them. Trump might be one of them. Exactly. So it, you know, it doesn't, it, you know, Jack Dorsey is an example, actually, of somebody who really is kind of over here, right? Jack Dorsey, RFK Jr. Basically, you pick up a bunch of tech founder type people, okay, left libertarians, and you lose um, some folks who will just reflexively side with the institutions they were born with. Who I, I understand those people. I'm often sympathetic to those people, but they're like the Soviet conservative. You know, they're somebody who defends the system they were born in, my country right or wrong. Does that make sense, right? Yep, so yeah. now the other thing about this, which is interesting is this term dollar nationalist, uh, actually I think it communicates a lot in just those two words. Basically one of my theses is, um, you know how in the, and then I'll kind of explain what, what I think the scenario is where. In, in 2010, the Arab Spring had happened. Okay. and. You know, Twitter and Facebook had been important in that. And so people knew that social media could like overthrow governments and, and, and so on. OK. But still, it would still have been considered crazy to say, um, you know, oh. Uh, in in 10 years, um, we're going to have the president of the United States, the most important political issue in the world is going to be whether the president of the United States can tweet. <laughs> right. Okay. That would have still been considered totally crazy. Right. And um, even knowing that Twitter was important for governments that had literally overthrown governments, it was thought, okay, that's something that's happening over there. It's like a weak government. It's not, I mean, like, obviously it's not going to happen to the U S government. It's not going to have the same kind of chaos, but it did. It took a little while longer. It took a few more years to build. Arguably, it started in 2015, you know, not too many years later, right? And so I think it's fair to say that all politics in the 2010s became social media, right? Easily. And it's been okay. completely normalized now. I mean, you had DeSantis doing his campaign announcement on Twitter spaces last week. That's right. Okay, so now here's my analogy. Similarly, in 2019, 2020, Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin had got, has gotten to the scale that every bank is aware of it. Every government is aware of it. By 2021, a country, El Salvador, had even adopted Bitcoin as its national or co-national currency. So clearly, this is something where every head of state, every bank, every CEO had heard of it. And yet, even it, like most, even most Bitcoin maximalists don't truly take it seriously because to take Bitcoin seriously, and there's still a bunch of things that we need to leap between here and there. And there's still, it's a Bitcoin experiment. It could still lose in a few ways, which I'll get to. It's not inevitable. You have to work to make it work. Right. But if you just like the most important thing in 
2021 was, could the president tweet? Which was a big leap from 2010. Eventually, the most important thing is going to be, does this government have enough Bitcoin to fund operations? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like if the price actually does rise, if, you know, they do devalue the dollar or the digital devaluation of the dollar, uh, things start to get really real. And a good precursor for that is thinking about what happened with Twitter. So long as Twitter and Facebook were just uh, toys, right? Because it's always a fad, a bubble, nobody cares, blah, blah. And in fact, you know, through the early 2010s, they were basically dismissed in this way. Okay. Even as people were using them more and more, right? But after they became important electorally, because it's really Twitter that elected Trump, Twitter elected Bolsonaro, Twitter elected Orban, Twitter elected, um, Twitter did Brexit, right? Twitter essentially led to uh, also BLM and other things. Twitter led to deviations left and right from the consensus. And uh, to stop is particularly the right deviations after um, 2016, this gigantic counteroffensive happened where the state tried to, and more, more generally the establishment, yep. um, constrained by the First Amendment. So the state couldn't directly regulate free speech. So instead it tried decentralized censorship by pressuring all these companies using social media, ironically enough, to censor social media, right? Us using Twitter cancellation campaigns and so on and so forth, as we all live through. And literally quartering Twitter's offices with FBI agents to... <laughs> yes, sense of particular individuals, but they just couldn't keep up the energy or they left like a door unlocked because it's still nominally a corporation. And like one guy was able to walk through that door. I mean, like you basically had to be Elon Musk to do what he did. Right. Because like, you know, a forty four billion dollar hostile takeover. There's not too many people in the world with the capability to do that and the will to do it and to hit the wall of fire that that he did you know because he hit quite a lot of flack right oh yes and then to fire go ahead oh no yeah i mean he he got the shit storm thrown at him absolutely and then firing all those people and turning the thing around and stabilizing the thing and, 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 and everything that he did net net now six months later seven months later we have truly true freedom of speech right or at least we have a lawn moderation as different from blue moderation, right? Every other platform you can post and you'll be blue moderated. And if you want to post that way, you can, but at least you've got a different version here, which is a lawn moderation. Go ahead. You're going to say, yeah, no, it's uh, the transition to Twitter. I mean, obviously like the stuff with Turkey a couple of weeks ago, it's like, uh, and well, you, yeah. I mean, the thing is he can't fight, he can't fight every single country at the same time. And in, in a real sense, um, the U S establishment is the most committed enemy of civil liberties and free speech around the world. And Turkey just doesn't have that power over everybody else in the same way. Right? Like literally that thing where like China was right about internet control, or here's another example, like, um, let's see if I can find this one. You can, by the way, you can cut out my reaching forward. Okay. No, <laughs> I'm sure fine. Like weird. Uh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Here, look at, like NYT literally runs headlines like free speech is killing us, you know? Um, and uh, here, you, could just, you can cut out my little Google prompt or whatever there. Free speech is killing us. Noxious language online is causing real world violence. What can we do about it? AKA censorship, right? So like there's the, the most committed enemy of freedom around the world, free speech, you know, civil liberties is the blue American. Like that's it, right? Turkey is downstream of that. None of that actually matters in my view. It's literally NYT that is advocating saying free speech is killing us, right? The Atlantic saying China was right on internet censorship. It's not even masked or hidden. It's like right out there, you know? Um, so that's why, you know, Elon is basically husbanding his political capital to fight the battle that matters. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because other ones are all downstream of that. Um, with that said, like, different countries are going to have different norms and different levels of moderation. They're all going to build their own sovereign social networks. Like a lot of this stuff will become commodity over time, right? There'll be some, you know, uh, remember Orkut? No. I don't know if you remember Orkut. Orkut was, uh, I think it was, it was a network by um, a Turkish guy uh, that was, was Orkut big in Turkey? 
Arca was big in like Turkey and Brazil, I think. It was an early social network that was that was popular, um, you know, around the time of Facebook. It got it got pretty big. Um, anyway, so so they may have their own like Orca 2.0 for like Turkey or something like that. So coming back to the stack. So basically, I think it is uh, it is possible as a sci-fi scenario. It is possible that um, if red states really lean into Bitcoin, and as you know, I'll just enumerate most of our most of viewers probably know this, but like Mississippi and Montana, thanks to like Satoshi Action and with uh, Dennis Porter, they have uh, Bitcoin Miner Protection Act. It's not just him, but you know a lot of people. But he's he worked hard on that. Um, Texas has the right to hold Bitcoin shall not be infringed. Colorado accepts Bitcoin for taxes. Uh, New Hampshire has very friendly cryptocurrency laws. Tennessee and Wyoming have Dow laws. Uh, Florida is against CBDC officially, and DeSantis is officially pro Bitcoin. Suarez and uh, you know Mayor Adams of Suarez of Miami and Mayor Suarez of Miami and uh, Mayor Eric Adams of New York accept Bitcoin for salary, and um, and and so on and so forth. There's quite a lot of red states, purple states, that are pro Bitcoin now, legislatively, as you're aware, right? So I think the next step right now, when we talk about the fiat crisis, the establishment is waging war. One way of thinking about it is the U.S. is not one country. It's two parties. Did I show you those graphs? Yeah. I mean, let me just bring that up if I haven't shown that. Well, yeah. I mean, you're seeing these trends pop up, too. I'm not sure if you've been paying attention to what's going on in Idaho and Oregon with the. Uh... Tell me about that. A lot of the counties in eastern Oregon are seceding to Idaho. I think they just had. To oh, go. yeah, 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 exactly. That's right. So, you know, the, the dynamic geography is going to happen, right? Where people are the big sort, right? So here, let me show you some graphs, right? You've probably seen this, but just see it in one place. It's not one country, it's two parties. Like, you can't have nationalism if there is no nation. Like, what's a nation? Mm -hmm. A nation is like, you can think of it as a lot of things, but a good way of thinking of it is a nation is a group of people that... Think of themselves as a people. But right now, Democrats are nationalists for Democrats, for the Democrat nation. Like what I mean by that is, uh, you know, this, this is a 70 year trend, by the way. This is like, this has been happening for a long time, even by 2011. This is, this is congressional votes, by the way. All blues vote with blues, all reds vote with reds. This is like the 9 11 votes or whatever, but it's very partisan, very little overlap. And what I mean, when, and this is also now visible, by the way, at the level of individual social networks, even by 2017, the red network was over here, the blue network was over here. They didn't friend each other, didn't follow each other. Okay, they're growing apart. Also, Democrats don't marry Republicans. Okay, <laughs> only 4% of marriages in this study are between Democrats and Republicans. Okay. That's pretty insane. That, that means ideology becomes biology in one generation. These are yeah. ethnic groups. Go ahead. <laughs> so I've, I haven't seen that stat before. That's pretty jarring. Yeah. So, so that's the thing is this is becoming something that's more Sunni versus Shiite. It already is Sunni versus Shiite or Hutu Tutsi than it is like a difference over policy. It's tribal, literally tribal. Okay. Um, also, Democrats don't hire Republicans. Right. If any Democrat controlled institution, like whether it's universities or it's like the New York Times or something like that, they don't hire Republicans. OK. And uh, like 91 percent of faculty were Democrats and 888, 808 departments did not employ a single Republican in this study. OK. There's lots of other studies like this. OK. So Democrats don't marry Republicans. Democrats don't hire Republicans. Democrats certainly don't vote for Republicans. And now Republicans are returning the favor. OK. So. Blues and reds have partitioned at the level of both network and state. Like blues have built one party Democrat states in Washington and California, and reds are now doing the reverse in Florida and Texas. Okay. So social political divergence is accelerating and you're seeing states, you, you see this uh, graph, like gun laws are diverging, right? Abortion rights are diverging. Marijuana, you know, drug legalization is diverging. Um, uh, homeschooling, education, post COVID, that's a huge issue. That's diverging, right, with me so far? School choice. School choice, that's be, exactly. That's going to yep. be a political or a campaign. It's already it's huge. Yeah. This guy, Corey DeAngelis, is a great person worth following. So so basically, um, these, these states are becoming as different as different countries, and so they may be, okay? Now, both sides have actually made attempts to put the country back together on their terms. Like, 
Wokeism, one way of thinking about it is it's a Democrat attempt to make Republicans knuckle under by accusing them of being insufficiently anti-racist. And nationalism <laughs> is like, go ahead. Yeah, it's just hilarious. I mean, it, it's hilarious how comical it's gotten, like the memes, like you're a white supremacist, you're, I mean... Like it's a you're, you're Latino ran... white supremacist or whatever. Yeah, exactly. It's ridiculous, <laughs> right? What, what they actually mean by that, by the way, is if you want, yeah, again, it's obvious, but the secret decoder ring is um, within the U.S., when they say white, they mean Republican. Yes. Right? That's actually what it means. Right? So you're a Republican. He's a Republican supremacist, you know, like against, they're against Republican supremacy, meaning they don't want Republicans to run things. And the way you can tell is... All of the blues that in 2020, they tore their shirts and they said how guilty they were. Oh, my God, they feel so guilty for their white privilege, blah, blah, blah. It's a systemically racist country. They tear down George Washington, all this shit, right? They did this in, in 2020. Then two years later, less than two years later, okay, they are telling Africans and Indians that their country is the champion of democracy and that all people of color should trust them and side with them. Okay. That was the pitch in like March, 2022, right? So not even two years after saying that the U S was a systemically racist country that was hor horrifically that no person of color could ever trust. They went with a straight face to India and Africa and, you know, so on. And they said, oh, you need to back us to the hill because we're like the good guys champion democracy, right? And now what's actually happening, by the way, what's funny is when you point this out to these blues, they're actually often shocked. They, they actually didn't even remember. It's very convenient yeah. that they didn't remember. Well, a couple of that with like Biden going, like, you're not black if you don't vote for me. It's like, that's right. Second. So, so <laughs> what's, what's actually happening here is they're genuinely surprised that you would bring up something from two years ago. But if you actually just look at it from the tribal lens, they were, quote, uh, against white supremacy when they were attacking Republicans and they were in a tribal war with Republicans. Once Blue Tribe pivoted to fighting Russians, now they're the champion of democracy. Right now, they're obviously the champion of human rights and all people of color should trust them and they're on the side of the good guys, right? Um, and so, you know, of course, this propaganda is so, like anybody with a, you, you know, in AI, there's a concept of the context window, like how much, how much history you yep. have, right? And like the smarter the AI, the more history and context it has on something. So if you have a context window that's more than like, like a month, like <laughs> a week, okay? You can now just totally cut this propaganda to shreds by simply quoting them from like a, two years ago against them today. Right? Go ahead. It, again, it's comical. It's comical. There's no it's logical comical. consistency. There's no, There's no logical introspection. There's no. And what it is, is I think they are selected actually for being, you know, the concept of like a method actor. Yep. So like a method actor. The same character. Oh, no, that's, that's like a character actor. Like character a method actor. actor yeah. Yeah, so it's like a method actor, you know, they inhabit the, the, the spirit of the character they're playing. It's like, um, I am Batman. I yes, growl yes. even when I'm offset. Go ahead. Yes. The dude who played Elvis, I was still in Brooklyn when they were, uh, <laughs> when they were filming that. And he was like wearing like tight jeans and a, and a tight black shirt with cigarettes rolled up in the sleeve. He was method acting. That's right. So these guys are, many of them are method actors they are NPCs where they get the software update and then they instantly now believe the same thing and they've always believed it, right? I mean, I can find things from like 2020 or earlier where I talk about Walter Durante and how the New York Times choked out Ukraine and how the Ox Salzburgers profited from, from this and they didn't return the Pulitzer or anything like that. Ox Salzburgers, that's a family that owns the New York Times. By the way, like they trash everybody as being, for, for a decade, everybody else was, you know, white and this and that. And I'm not the kind of person, by the way, who thinks white is an insult, okay? But these guys are, you know, the, the family that owns the New York Times is literally rich white nepotists, you know? <laughs> and like, uh, you know, they, they, in particular, they trash like Mark Zuckerberg so hard. But you know what? Zuckerberg built his fortune and Salzburger inherited his. Like they just like hate merit and so on. Anyway, point is, uh, before 2020, I used to sometimes talk about Walter Duranty in Ukraine. And you know what I'd get back often on Twitter or elsewhere? You know what people would tell me? They'd be like, policy, nobody cares about Ukraine. That's what they would say. 
<laughs> okay. Right. They'd be like, yeah. I mean, they thought of Ukraine as like, if I said Bolivia today, who cares about Bolivia, right? They literally, honestly, truly didn't care. They had no emotional reaction to it whatsoever. Someone would even deny to me that, you know, oh, Stalin didn't actually even mean to do it or this kind of stupid stuff, right? They obviously choked out the entire country. Then a couple of years later, stand with Ukraine, you know, like with the flag. And so it's flag and the now, emoji. A, yeah. Or flag like, in the profile. I'm actually, I'm actually symp I'm sympathetic to, I mean, the Ukrainians had a tough century. Like th they're like the Poles, you know, they got crushed by multiple people, overrun, starved, all I'm sympathetic to them, you know, like the average Ukrainian has had a pretty tough time of it. But this like really cynical, like regime operative who it doesn't even think of them. They're, like, they're you know what they're actually like in China. Um, and this is actually a funny parallel. Okay. How many, most people don't know this. Do you know how many, um, in China, by the way, they don't call it CCP. They call it CPC. Okay. And CCP is a tell that you're like hostile to China. CPC is what they call it within China. Okay. Communist Party of China. Um, do you know how many CPC members there are? Mm, no. What's your guess? 800? Like yeah, in the, actually, within the. So that's a, so it's a really good question, right? There's actually a hundred million CPC members. CCP. It's about, yeah. so on the one hand, it's like a huge number of people. On the other hand, it's like 6% of society. Yeah. Okay. And it's like a, it's yeah, basically like a been flipped. Well, I mean, it's 1.4 billion people or whatever. So even, even a hundred million people, it's actually a relatively small group. Okay. Yeah. And what does a CPC member do? Well, first they're expected to kind of be like an example to their community. They're constantly watching out for deviations from the party line. Um, they will keep, they will read the official things from like journals like Kyushi, which kind of explain what Xi and, and the, the, the central committee have decided. And then they will explain them in their own words. They'll write longhand interpretations of them and so on and so forth. Right. And that sounds really boring until you realize that America has an analog, you know, the, the NYT subscriber is almost exactly analogous to the, the CPC member in China. Mm -hmm. Okay. Millions of people subscribe to that official regime outlet and then they pass the opinions off as if they're their own. And they're looking for deviations from wrong think within their company. Right. And just like the DI officer in the U S that's like the CCP officer at every company in China to make sure you're not too divergent from the party line. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's like, it's amazing how, you know, obviously there's some differences in the systems, but it's really kind of impressive how it's like evolved to be the same type of thing, you know? Oh, and it's, and go ahead. It's insane how they'll get the message and they'll run with it. Like learn to code is my favorite example. Like when they were telling all the coal miners to go learn to code. And then as soon as there were layoffs and, uh, right in the media sector and people are like oh, that was banned on twitter holding up a mirror literally banned the hashtag right right exactly right and you know the thing is that um i actually you know uh, some of them i assume are good people right <laughs> so to speak <laughs> in the sense of what i mean by that is um i think most of the media is just like has become or genuinely evil but there were people who just like to write about travel or something like that, you know, and those all got filtered out. And only those people who just enjoyed knifing people for the regime, those became like the dominant voices within the media, especially by the late 2010s. You know, part of it is uh, because the pay in media became so poor after the financial crisis, like normal people couldn't actually have a job in media anymore. You had to be a totally status hungry sociopathic, usually born rich kid. So that's a secret, by the way, lots of these journos have trust funds of some kind, right? Yep. It's not just Ox Salzberger, you know, Arthur Salzberger of the Ox Salzberger family. It's like Kara Swisher is born rich, right? So many of these journos went to like expensive private schools and so on and so forth. And you know who they hate the most? New money. Yeah, the new right? rich. Exactly. The first gen, you know, like, like lots of tech guys, right? The founder, not the inheritor. The exactly. That's right. So that's actually, by the way, just to talk about that for a second, this is 
one of the least documented, I think it's actually even more important in some ways than the blue red political axis is the blue gray political axis. Okay, so blue red, we hear lots and lots about that. that, that you know a lot about Democrat, Republican. But let's talk about like establishment versus tech, because obviously Elon is a huge part of this whole thing. And it's kind of, you know, gray is its own small, but very high strength ratio, ratio tribe. One way to think about gray tribe is it, have you heard the term gray tribe before, by the way? No. Okay, it comes from like Scott Alexander, uh, his blog in 2014. One way of thinking about it is, you know how like Yale split off from Harvard? Mm -hmm. Right? Grays are like blue defectors, you know? Raised in blue cities, often went to blue colleges, but did math and science and computer science, not humanities and other stuff. And what happened, and then a lot of them came from abroad, okay? And so Silicon Valley was like the main gray outpost, but now it's decentralized. Like now gray is global. There's tech and entrepreneurship and venture capital worldwide. Most of the unicorns are now outside the United States. Most of the investment is now outside the United States. Most of the, like a lot of that stuff is happening outside. I'm not saying San Francisco or California isn't still a center. It is a center, but there's other centers. Um, and so the thing is that the, like the, the blue versus gray split is worth really understanding because um, that's the elite and the counter elite in the sense that, uh, of course, these are, these are porous boundaries, okay? But uh, essentially, if you think about how blues relate to reds, John Stewart is just contemptuous of your average Southerner, okay? Um, that he's like constantly is shitting on them. And part of that, part of the reason is that the, the, the red, I mean, what is a Republican Harvard? Is it, is it like Hillsdale, right? What is a Republican Hollywood? It's some, I don't know, some people making memes online, you know, in many ways, the reds are just, you know, they have, they have Fox news, I guess, right? Uh, they kind of have like the op-ed page of the wall street journal, but for the most part, the reds are playing at a huge disadvantage relative to blues control of institutions. But Grays set up their own institutions or their new things. And so, um, you know, like what is a uh, competitor to Hollywood? Well, actually, YouTube and Netflix and so on are actually better than Hollywood in some ways. And what's a competitor to Harvard? Well, online education, again, YouTube, but also Coursera, Udacity, et cetera. Now, the counter argument is blues have recaptured some of this gray territory. The counter counter argument is grays can keep founding new ones. Mm -hmm. And they are doing so. And you're also seeing, especially post-Trump, that gray kind of founder CEO spirit assert itself against Elizabeth Warren types. You know, one way of thinking about like the gray kind of founder CEO and like Jack, Jack Dorsey is kind of like this, um, not to call out any one person, but many of them just couldn't really respect Trump because they didn't think he was as good a CEO or founder as they were. You know, that's like, that's, that's reductionist, but it's funny. They didn't want to report to a man that they didn't think of as like better at executing than they were, you know, mm -hmm. but they also don't want to fold into like, like this extremely stupid regime that, that is in power now. Right. So they're, they're just like, uh, you know, you, you don't become a billionaire founder CEO without a very strong will to power. You know, some of them, like the older ones, you know, they, they become like, you know, Bill Gates and they, they go and do the giving pledge or whatever. And they just kind of, they accept the establishment bridle, you know, but enough grays have gone rogue as you've seen. Right. And it's, it's a lawn, obviously that's a, that's, that's the most public one, but it's Dorsey, obviously Mark Anderson is being very public. Um, you know, Sachs with all in, right. Quite a few grays have now, um, you know, they're not, you know, and I think, I think in my own way, I think I've contributed to this, you know, in, in a, hopefully a positive way. I would never go to the South and like, you know, or, or even Texas and pretend that I was like going to be shooting guns and one of the good old boys or something like that. Right. That's your culture. That's your people's culture. And I'm not saying that in a patronizing way at all. Just like my people's culture is dosas and thyar chatham and, and vada from like South India. All right. Right. Of course, there's aspects of American culture that we both share, but the like, for lack of a better term, the gray or the tech libertarian ish kind of person, the tech CEO, the tech founder and the red, uh, this is actually also in some ways crypto and Bitcoin. Okay. 
like mm -hmm. in terms of those two different cultures, there are overlaps and there are shared areas of interest as opposed to blue. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe that's all obvious, but I think one thing that is underappreciated by lots of reds is how much gray and blue have fought over the last 10 years. As the very explicit is the political fights, you know, which you see it's labeled between Democrat and Republican, but it's incredibly visible within tech, at least, that the establishment also hates the tech guys. They hate and, and that they, they managed to capture the big tech companies, right? They managed to capture Amazon and, and others with blues. And actually, if you notice, many of those CEOs have left because the organization is overrun with blues. Mm -hmm. But they haven't captured the brains of the next generation. And a lot of the folks who are founders of 100 billion or $10 billion companies are just pure gray and they're not blue. Even red sympathetic in some ways, right? At least today. However, I think enough reds are now mad at gray because they, I saw this during SVB. A lot of reds have been convinced that all grays are blue. Mm -hmm. well, right? yeah, I, mean, I mean, particularly with like the censorship during the election, exactly. and COVID with all that, it's left a really bad taste that, in everybody's mouth. Of course, and I totally understand that. What basically happened is over the course of the 20, see the original kind of gray spirit, like early 2000s, even before gray tribe was like even a thing, was like Linux and open source. And it was like a fight the man kind of culture, right? And it was, Twitter called itself the free speech wing of the free speech party. And Google, it would laugh if, if you ever said that anybody would censor their search and so on. This was, this was how they were in the 2000s and the early 2010s before it was considered a threat to the regime. What happened in the mid 2010s, especially after 2012 is, and that, that was actually the exact moment, starting in spring of 2013 is when the tech lash by blue against gray began. And basically what had happened, just to show you this chart, um, Well, as you're describing all this, I think what many would define as like Bitcoin maximalists, they're like the red and the gray coming together, getting back. To yeah, that, that kind, yes, th there is an aspect of that. The thing is that um, I think, yes, there's absolutely an aspect of that. Now, let me talk about that uh, here. Here we go. Ready? Look at this. This is like a really important graph to keep in mind to understand the just degree of economic warfare between blues and grays. Okay. Can you see this graph? Yep. Okay. So this is newspaper advertising revenue adjusted for inflation. Okay. 1950 to 2014. So for most of the century, like it was good to be blue, you know, but like peak was like 2000, almost $70 billion in ad revenue. And what this meant is you could write like five or 10 articles a year. You could fly around smoke cigars, being like a time journalist was like an awesome job. You had a lot of influence. You had, um, you know, a pretty easy schedule. Uh, you could write about what you wanted. It was actually a pretty good job, right? Then, you know, things were kind of flattened after, you know, the financial crisis, no, the dot-com crash, right? Uh, but they were okay. And this was the period where like tech was ignored after the, you know, dot-com crash. And this was like the period of, um, you know, Iraq and, and, and all this type of stuff. And, you know, so media was just kind of doing its own thing. Then suddenly, once a financial crisis hit, their revenue, so Google had been scaling during that time. And, and at this point, all these advertisers were like, let me look for a more efficient channel. It was 2008. The internet was still actually pretty new, but it wasn't brand, brand, brand new. And so all this money suddenly went to Google. Look at that. Look at that absolutely massive drop off. Okay. This thing all the print media, all these journos saw all their money go to Google like overnight. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And then Facebook zoom like this. Okay. So by, by the, you know, it took them one election cycle to adapt because in 2012, right? The, um, I don't know if you remember this, uh, Facebook was still considered to be and social media was considered to be, um, pro Democrat. Right. Uh, meaning, you know, when the nerds go marching in, right, like, you know, uh, how a dream team of engineers from Facebook, Twitter and Google built the software that drove Barack Obama's reelection. OK, November 16, 2012. Do you see that? Yeah. 
Okay. Hope, change. Hope, change. Ex- well, actually, no, this is, this, this is a re-election. Okay. Real. So, all right. And even uh, in um, May of 2012, okay, they were writing articles like, uh, there's no such thing as a programmer, May of 2012. <laughs> okay. But by the, um, oops, by the uh, next year, okay, but not even one year later, okay, by, or maybe like, uh, it's actually sooner than this, but by August 2013, would you just look at all these rich people? That's value with editorial vision and nutshell could be so much more. Essentially, they were just, um, attacking tech people every single day in very slanderous terms for anything they did. Very personal attacks, right? Bitter, venomous attacks, okay? And, uh, you know, we're talking like lying about them, stalking them, all this type of stuff. You could just be an executive at any company. You could be a random engineer. They just target you for cancellation, okay? Peter were Thiel you aware Gawker, of this? All Go that ahead. stuff. Peter Thiel Gawker. Yeah, exactly. That's right. All those guys, right? And I think you were probably aware that they had done this like Peter Thiel, but you may not be aware or your audience may not be aware that they did this to like everybody in tech. Okay. And the reason they were doing this is because they lost so much money to tech and they couldn't build search engines or, uh, or, or write social networks. You know, what they could do is they could uh, create stories and shape narratives. And so they essentially wrote a story where tech guys were bad and they were good. And, you know, tech was uniquely vulnerable to this. You know why? It's because in the 2000s, uh, the very early 2000s, there was this guy, Terry Summel, who ran Yahoo. And he was like an old media guy. And he tried to do like TV on the internet way before broadband was feasible. And what everybody in tech learned from that was you don't do content. Instead, you build a dumb pipe. Google, Mm -hmm. YouTube, Dropbox, Facebook, Twitter, all of them were based on just solve the technical problems and we're not building any content ourselves. The users are bringing the content and we're just totally neutral. Maybe we filter porn and spam, but that's about it and let them go, go for it, right? That was a, first of all, that was a good thing to do because content has risk. You know, when you fund content, you're paying money for it. User generated content, no risk. They're, they're taking all the risk on it. You know, they're generating the content, whether it's a video or a post, right? So as user generated content was this amazing innovation and for basically 12 years, it was awesome because tech could just focus on the tech and then other people brought their own content. Until 2013, when now media still controlled content and they decided to go to war with tech, basically it was after tech had helped get Obama reelected that the knives came out. With me so far? Okay. Yeah. So then, so then for the next six years, um, you know, you can see it, by the way, it's not something, you know, I... Uh, well, this is why like, the trend of like own your content strategy or distribution is becoming bigger. At least that's what and, we Oh, exactly. Us. That's right. So, so, so I'll, I'm going to get to this. Yeah, that's exactly right. So here, can you see that? Facebook things in New York Times coverage of it has gotten more critical. It has January 2019. Okay. So, you know, generally NYT articles were positive on Facebook and notice they started trending down before the election. And then they got really negative, right? So that trend line is happening before, you know, um, October 2016 or November 2016. Okay. And the reason is the tech lash had already begun and um, you could see it burgeoning. And uh, so essentially what was the consequence of that? By stalking all kinds of people in tech, by canceling them, this is actually why San Francisco became such a shithole. Anybody who pointed out the homeless problem in San Francisco was hammered online. So all the tech guys learned to not talk about it. And so it just got worse and worse and worse. And uh, this is also why all kinds of wokes got pushed into tech companies because you're constantly trolled for your, quote, lack of diversity by, you know, and look, I, this, this honestly feels like... Uh, multiple generations ago at this point. But um, what's funny about this here, look at this.
tech, look, I, I, I'm not the kind of person who thinks white is an insult, but the journalists are. And mm -hmm. they would constantly call tech white, 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 white. Oh my God, you're so white, blah, blah, blah. And they're 40, 30 to 40 points wider than, than tech is, which is like mostly, you know, immigrants. <laughs> yeah. You see this graph? Yeah. Right? So it's a complete inversion of reality to go after tech for being, quote, you know, racist or cliquish or whatever, when this is basically an entirely a thing. The journals were just projecting, right? Nevertheless, that race trolling was successful in getting a bunch of DI type people into tech companies in the 2010s. And that is how the internet censorship stuff was affected. Okay, so blues affected essentially a social war hostile takeover of gray institutions. And partly, of course, there were grays. I mean, one way of thinking about it is lots of grays are math guys. And they went to college. And alongside like the math and programming stuff that was installed in their head, they also got humanities malware. <laughs> okay. And so it's like, you've seen the movie, The Manchurian Candidate? Yes. Right? It's so they had this latent blue malware that they'd gotten installed at Harvard or Stanford or MIT. And they didn't take it too seriously. But then in 2013 or 2014, when, you know, uh, the New York Times started broadcasting the signal, right? Their eyes started glowing blue. And, they, and within these organizations, they became like blue zombies. Yes. Okay, it was like awakening that latent malware, all the moral premises. Because the thing is, you know, most people don't go and wipe and reinstall their moral operating software too many times in their life. Very few people do that. Most people keep the default install that they had in K through 12 and college, and they just don't think that deeply about it for the rest of their life, you know, especially lots of tech guys. It's just sitting so, there like a zero day. Like, <laughs> exactly, right? So they had gone to these woke madrasas, right? That's what Harvard and so on are. We should install this humanities malware and, you know, to mix metaphors. And so then hitting the right button at the right time, their eyes glue, glue blue, and they didn't have counter arguments against it, right? They didn't, you know, there, there's a few people who are like born to argue, like, like you or me or whatever. Not too many people are like born to argue, right? And to be good at math or whatever, it's actually a relatively rare combination. So, so that is how Gray got, uh, this is the thing I was mentioning before, where blue is at simultaneous war with Trump, tech, Russia, China, and blue is good at getting groups to fight each other. So blue got gray to hit red. And now red, I think, in a, in a kind of reactive way, thinks all tech is woke. It is true now. I mean, it's good that like Sachs and Elon and Dorsey and Anderson and others are out there in different ways. Uh, of course, they all don't agree with each other. You know, um, that's the thing. They're not, um, it's not like a movement like, uh, like the wokes. The wokes are one Borg that has one mm. party line. Right. The, the grays all have their own character and they have obvious disagreements with each other or whatever at times, but they are human beings. You know, they have their own opinions and so on. So anyway, that's while, while, while digressive, I think it's really important to understand for, for people to understand that there's lots of grays tech guys who are not blue. Um, they may not be red either. And, and why might they might be red? It's because more than 50 percent are immigrants, you know, so. Like they're, you know, they're, they're Korean or they're Chinese or they're Indian or they're Persian or they're, uh, you know, like from the Middle East or something like that. And um, they just, you know, they, they weren't raised like five generations in America or, or something like that. This also, by the way, is actually why, um, you know, the reason the blue-gray divergence is so extreme is, well, first – Grays were in Silicon Valley and blues were in, you know, the, the New York, Boston, Washington corridor. So geographically, they were separate. Second, demographically, blues uh, didn't really, you know, if you were in a blue household and one of your, um, you know, your, your spouse went to zero because their advertising went away. If you married like a Google executive and it balanced out, you might not have been so mad. But they were across the country. So they didn't have like inter-household kind of thing, right? So demographically, they're different because blues are like disproportionately old money, Northeastern establishment. 
and grays are disproportionately like tech, especially Asian immigrants, Indian immigrants, and so on. And the third is ideologically and just kind of personality wise, blues are verbal and political and media oriented and so on. And grays are, you know, quote, autistic in the sense of, you know, good with computers, good with math, literal, you know, numerical, et cetera. So those three differences, the geographical, the demographic, and the psychological led to like a partition here between like the quote elite and the counter elite. And it didn't necessarily have to happen that way. Um, you know, there's alternate realities where if Steve Jobs hadn't died, for example, it's possible that Bezos bought the Post, Jobs bought the Times, and Larry Page or Zuckerberg buys the Wall Street Journal. And if so, we'd be on Mars by now. <laughs> Okay. Well, I really do. I really do believe that. And the reason I do believe that is a huge part of the last 10 years is, um, so have you seen the graph of like woke words going through the roof? Oh, yes. That's what I was going to say. Like talking about the blues attacking everybody at the same time that, um, in 2013, they were coming after tech for DEI stuff. They were the, the utterance of like anti-racist and white supremacy started going through the roof. That's exactly right. And so the thing is, the way to understand it is the New York Times in particular caused a trillion dollars or more of damage to the social fabric to make a billion dollars in, in stock revenue. OK, so here this is New York Times word usage frequency. OK, 1970 to 2018. OK, and uh, this is the let me see if I can zoom in on the graph. So. Um, sexism, misogyny, all this stuff, right, goes out. I mean, and you've got control words, by the way, like Amazon is like on a natural exponential, right? Um, you know, but there's other things that are on fake exponentials, like intersectionality. That's an editorial decision, right? These words don't appear there by accident. It's an editorial decision to appear there. And now recently they've made an editorial decision to remove it. Okay. They're, they're, if you notice, they're much less woke in the, it's, it's like, it's like pouring chemicals into the water supply, right? One way of thinking about it is, um, have you seen the NYT stock price? It's I have like, not checked here. it. I can't imagine so, it's doing well. Well, here we are. So ready? Um, basically, they, so especially after the financial crisis, they got absolutely crushed, okay? They're down, to, they're down from like, you know, um, Pre-financial crisis, they were like 26, whatever, right? And then afterwards, they just tanked all the way down to like 442, okay? Can you see my cursor there, right? Yep. And then they were kind of like just bumping along the bottom, and they had to take out this whole loan from Carlos Slim. And then in, <laughs> you know, it was huge, it was a big loan from Carlos Slim. They, it kind of rattled up a little bit. And then they discovered like, you know, woke trolling and political warfare with Trump in particular, and whoosh, all the way up over here, right? They basically, you know, essentially, um, till late 2021, mid, mid late 2021, they basically, uh, I shouldn't say 10x their stock price, I don't know, but it's like 5x or something like that, okay? And so the, uh, the Ox Salzburgers that own the New York Times made um, hundreds of millions of dollars from this, okay? Uh, and, um, but they did so, at the cost of like tearing the social fabric, okay? And just to, you know, put not too fine a point on it, um, here is, uh, you know, here's like a, whatever, here's like a graphic of this, okay? So they, they published their proxy statement so you can actually see, right? And, um, and by the way, you know, what's funny is uh, you would recognize Mark Zuckerberg, right? You've seen Mark Zuckerberg's face a thousand times, right? Mm -hmm. You would not recognize Arthur G. Salzberger, the guy who owns the New York Times. Nope. Right. And yet, isn't that amazing? This guy who is surrounded by a thousand journalists at all times, you've never heard of him. He's the only person who has privacy in the world. Yeah. It's kind of amazing, right? It's like, pretty insane. Zuck, I, I don't agree with every decision Zuck has taken, but Zuck is at least like the man in the arena taking the hits. And, you know, one thing again to know about like Zuck and Facebook is a lot of his people went, became blue zombies at the same time. So he couldn't like fire half his company. In fact, I'll show you something that he did in 2019. Zuck gave a talk on free expression in 2019, where, um, which he did not have to do, right? Basically here. Yeah, 
that sucks. Interesting, particularly like right now, it seems like he's. I don't know if you would call it a mea culpa or something like that, but he called out the FBI and their pressure, and now he's getting yes. like, all jacked doing combat sports, like finding his men exactly. Uh, so this thing is, I'm trying. I mean, there are folks within Gray. I mean, Gray is a spectrum, right? There's folks like, let's say, Mark Benioff or uh, the eBay founder Pierre Omidyar, who are just true blue all the way through, basically, mm-hmm. right? Um, uh, with, with exceptions, it's it's complicated. Sometimes they'll you know they'll, they'll support somebody else, but like Zuck really is Zuck was somebody whose hand was forced and wasn't in full control of his org, in my view, right? Someone like Jack, okay, and yeah, you can see like Zuck lifting, and you look at Bezos getting jacked and so on. These guys. You know, these are will to power founders who did not like knuckling under to the establishment, but in many ways, invisible to the public, had a gun to their head. I mean, in, in its own way, like, you know, you might think, oh, this guy who's like super rich has all this optionality that uh, like a like a, an employee of some company doesn't. Right. This is actually often not true. And what I mean by that is, yeah, sure, they can buy like a bigger car or something. But if you're a CEO of a very large company, you're very constrained in what you can say and what you can do. There's so many people who are paying attention to every word you say. And in fact, um, especially if you're like a really famous billionaire, uh, there's people who spend an entire year or multiple years trying to get like one meeting with you, you know, and they're they're They are like analyzing you like a like a like a CIA officer and and. You know, so this is actually why, for example, why does, uh, uh, you know, both Zuck and G do this? They maintain an impassive expression. The reason they do that is even like a smile or something like that in a meeting will be like, oh, he endorses my thing. He's going to invest $10 million and people run off half cock like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, It's like Janet Yellen wearing a purple jacket. She's wearing royal colors. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Or confident right now. Exactly. It's kind of, it's kind of like that where uh, you cannot really, it, the larger the organization you're running, the harder it is to just actually be a human being. Elon is the exception that proves the rule, you know, and maybe we're going back into the time of actual individuals running something, but at least during the period I'm talking about in the 2010s. Anyway, I'm just explaining that lots of gray isn't blue. It's not necessarily red, but it's definitely not blue. And now that there isn't one clear leader in the U.S. anymore, they don't have to knuckle under to Trump. It's kind of a free for all. It just feels like a totally different world than even 2020. Like it is digital glasnost, like some icebergs are broken because I'm not sure exactly when it happened. But sometime in 2021, 2022, it became difficult to cancel people. I, I well, mean, Elon, I think, go ahead. I think it had to do Elon's with a vaccine huge component mandates. Of it. Go ahead. Vaccine oh, mandates really? like going from safe and effective to obviously not effective and arguably not safe really set off something in people's heads where it's like, wow, you just lied to us, locked us down. It's, it's something where it's funny. It's, I would love to see a quantification of this, but I feel it's something where blues have just lost so much support from so many different groups because they fought everybody at the same time, you know, like lots and lots of tech guys, for example, just like a small thing. Some like a, you mentioned the vaccines. That's, that's a big thing in your neighborhood, right? A big thing in my social neighborhood was the, you know, New York Times attacking Scott Alexander, okay, who writes, writes this popular blog, mm-hmm. journalist versus rationalist. And from that, tons and tons and tons of very smart people who are good at arguing on the internet got, for lack of a better term, red-pilled because they're like, wait a second, the New York Times is lying about Scott Alexander. What else are they lying about? Mm-hmm. They're like, they're, they're wildly distorting him, Right. And that's that's the thing that breaks the illusion, the gel man amnesia. People have to see a falsification of something that's close to them to see that they're lying about everything. But anyway, so so, yeah, I think you're right about, you know, covid lockdowns. I think it's fighting with other tribes. What it is, is they've blue can only defend blue now. Blue can no longer blue no longer has, you know, in football, like there's a free safety, like run and just tackle somebody. Right. Blue no longer has free safeties. I started noticing this around the time of uh, the Joe Rogan thing with Spotify, right? Blue used to have enough troops that on social media, if one person liked a comment defending somebody who's being canceled, they would get pile drive too, right? So Blue used to just have total 
you know, just, just a bunch of enforcers running around, right? And then they just, the thing is to do that, you have to be like 99-1. But by the time of the Rogan thing with Spotify, yes, they could grind out a win. They did manage to get Spotify to pull down some Rogan episodes or whatever, but they couldn't cancel everybody who supported Rogan. And so if you graph it, right, you're going from 99-1 to like 55-45, because I, I graph some of these things, right? Yeah, it had like so a diminishing, s- diminishing marginal return on utility. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Their ability to cancel was dropping off, right? Also, yeah. another example of this in 2020, for years before, they had been canceling tech execs left and right, okay? For anything and everything. Oh, my God. Just they, they literally, they have some slack room where they find the latest tech guy. They just attack them like rabid dogs, right? And then in 2020, we had just an absolute Donnybrook back and forth between tech and media. And the crucial thing was the tech now had a spinal column and was actually pushing back. Gray was pushing back on blue. And there's like, I won't bore you with every single back and forth there, but the fundamental thing is blue is waving that cancellation wand really, really hard. And when it doesn't work and when other people see it's not working and when the target of it is not apologizing and not backing down, and crucially has enough social support that they're not fired or whatever, then it like it, it kind of breaks the cancellation one's power because it has to be like one shot, one kill, you know? So Blue is now kind of retreated to, uh, like their media power, their soft power is gone, but they still have two powers left. The money power and the military power. Yes. The intelligence apparatus, which is... It's going to be Very crazy, well. right? Yeah. Do you want to pause for like uh, two minutes? I'll just get some water. Then let's talk fiat crisis. Yes, we can do that. Okay. Okay, good. So basically, uh, to, to quickly summarize last few hours of, <laughs> of prelude, right? A, um, we're now in a multipolar world. China's actually quite strong. Foreign affairs is admitted that it's a multipolar world. Um, you know, uh, Folks like Fiona Hill have given speeches saying that. So A, it's a multipolar world. B, um, the U.S. media has exhausted their, they spent down all their trust. Like the graphs look like this, you know? They've spent down all their trust and Blue Tribe used U.S. media to capture good parts of uh, the um, U.S. establishment, like especially at the federal level, and big parts of tech but they spent out all their trust to get that. They just exhausted that weapon. The soft power is gone. And um, there's a significant difference between gray and blue, which we talked about. And gray is not blue, but gray is also not red. It's kind of like a third tribe or whatever. Sort of like, I don't know, Kurds and Iranians and Sunnis, you know, all in the Middle East are like actually different tribes. Some of them might be small, but they punch above their weight or whatever, right? Um, and uh, fourth, it's not one party. It's not one country. It's at least two parties. I showed those graphs where it showed how pulled apart the parties are, right? Socially and cognitively, it's not really one country. You can't think of it as a single unit anymore. Um, so now putting that all together, that's like the state of, state of affairs, right? Blue Tribe is losing abroad because it's losing control of the world. And it's losing at home because it's losing control of the country. And it's used its media weapon, and it's exhausted that. But it has two weapons left. There's media, there's money, and there's military. And so right now, we're in the middle of Blue using the money weapon. And when I say Blue is using it, right, uh, what people will immediately jump to is like, oh, my God, what is a conspiracy theory, blah, blah. And the thing about this is uh, when, when it was like communism, right, then you had Stalin, you had Mao, you actually had a guy in charge, and they did all kinds of KGB subversion, you know, type stuff. And we found out later that actually, you know, uh, the Soviets had riddled the U.S. government with spies. There's the Venona decrypts and all the type of stuff. So that those quote, conspiracy theories were real. Today, it's we're dealing not with communism, which is centralized left, but wokeness is decentralized left, and. So it's adapted in a different way where it doesn't have one single guy in charge. There's nodes, you know, there's, there's influential, you know, uh, groups or whatever. But there's no one single person or whatever, like a Stalin who's like directing things. So it's not a centralized thing. What it is, though, 
I think uh, is um, it, it's tribal in the following sense. If you just give one premise, which is that every blue in the U.S. establishment, whenever they make a decision, they're thinking about the politics of it. Okay, and that's not a big premise. Okay, that's a pretty reasonable thing to say. They're not simply thinking country first. They're also thinking party first. Remember, 96% of Democrats are not married to Republicans. They are nationalists for Democrats, increasingly just as Republicans are becoming nationalists for Republicans, right? It's not one country, it's two parties. Once, once you think about it that way, if every decision that you're making as a government official, you're calculating, does this help blue or does this hurt red or gray? or ideally both. Okay, example, remember in late 2021, there was like just the the notification on COVID that went out and they were like, I hope you die Republicans. Do you remember that? Yes, the, uh, the, the winter of death. The winter of death, I forget the exact language, but it's just not something that you would expect a government agency to ever put out, right? If it was like for all the people, but it's not for all the people. It was like Sunni talking to Shiites or Hudu to Tutsis or whatever, right? It was it was Democrat to Republican. That's that's like a those are two different tribes, right? Democrat doesn't value Republicans in the same way as they do to other blues, and increasingly vice versa. So, um, so once you just have that one premise that blue is calculating the politics of every decision, does it help blue or hurt gray or red? And by the way, anybody who's in a position to make that decision has to be being very good at blue politics to get there. Right. They, they're literally they're usually a political appointee, you know, or there's somebody who is favored enough by the blue establishment to have that position today. Right. So they are a political calculator. They're good at that. OK, this multiplied across 20 different agencies is how you get something that looks like a coordinated attack against gray and red. OK, because the guy at the SEC now, crucially, there's sometimes door jams where the SEC guy and the CFTC guy are calculating blue interests and red and gray hurt, but they're also calculating their own self-interest. And so SEC and CFTC both try to regulate the same product and they have a door jam, right? So this accounts for the degree of disorganization and collisions we often see where these agencies get in each other's way, right? Um, still, once you have this premise, now you see, okay, that's how it looks like the SEC and the Fed and um, you know, Warren and this and that and so on are all attacking Bitcoin banks and the crypto industry at the same time. They kind of are, but they're taking cues horizontally and tribally. Okay. And, and I think that's a good model for how it works. You literally only have one premise, which is their politically calculating decision. And when you do that, you get something where, for example, let's take the tribal filter and apply it to the current banking situation. So as your viewers may know, um, banks started dying about, you know, eight weeks ago with, uh, with the collapse of SVB, Signature, Silvergate, um, Credit Suisse, and, uh, and First, <clears throat> First Republic. And there's others that are now, quite a few others that are now publicly struggling. And this is a quote, you know, somebody called it a bank walk rather than a bank run at B Anchor mm -hmm. Research. Because banks don't have, um, <clears throat> they don't have all their numbers on chain. So you only get them with quarterly reports. So deposits are moving, but you don't get really great real-time analytics until every quarter. So as quarterly reports come out, there's a huge update to the system. Everyone's like, oh my God, that bank has huge losses and you'll see more banks collapse or have problems. Okay. So that's kind of why the TikTok clock of this is sort of quarterly, right? Yeah, and if you but, look at the stock prices, it's literally like they're walking a plank. They'll like drop and yeah. teeter off. Exactly. And go to zero. That's right. As more information comes. Exactly. That's right. So for your viewers to understand what happened, I, so I can give like a short version, a more complicated version, more complicated version. One of the things the system is set up to do is make simple things complicated. You know, it's not a mortgage. It is a... Uh, they, they'll put it, they'll tranche it and they'll slice it up and, and securitize it and collateralize debt obligations and all of this mumbo jumbo so they can lie to themselves and lie to you about, uh, you know, whether this toxic waste is actually valuable, right? 
And so the whole system is set up this way. We're not just printing money. Oh, it's quantitative easing. We're not just printing money. It's a, it's a BTFP program. We're buying it at par. It's a loan. All of this alchemy and abracadabra mumbo jumbo is meant to make a simple thing complicated. So the simple thing is in 2023, it's not just a financial crisis. It's a fiat crisis because in 2008, um, you know, the, you know, time was bought by pulling the crisis up from the level of banks to the government. Now there's no more level to pull it up to, right? It's like the currency itself, the government that, that takes the hit. That's kind of a, that's a very macro way of looking at it. Um, another way of thinking about this is this is not just a banking crisis. It's a bond crisis. If mortgage backed securities were the toxic waste in 2008, where they were rated AAA, but they were actually extremely unsafe, treasuries themselves are the toxic waste of 2023. And Dalio has said this, by the way, I've got like this, uh, you know, I've got a few tweets on this, but look at look at Ray Dalio. This is not just a bank crisis, not a single bank thing. It's a it's a bond crisis, right? It is something that every institution that bought bonds in 2021 got wrecked by the Fed. Essentially, what happened is just like the banks in 2008, they sold mortgages that were not worth what they said they were worth or thought they were worth. They were marketed as AAA. The, the Treasury in 2021 sold bonds that the Fed then devalued in 2022. Basically, if you think of the Fed and Treasury as one unit, the government sold an asset to its best customers that it then massively devalued. Sticking all of these banks, all these institutions, all these loyal blues, just like Stalin killing his most loyal communists, Powell killed his most loyal banks. Yeah. And if you go okay. back and look at like the dot plots in December 2021, the Fed governors were choreographing like, oh, we're only going to raise rates like one and a half percent. And yeah, five percent. Exactly. Right. That's right. So through 2020 and 2021, inflation was transitory. Or actually, you at first, you were a moron for saying inflation was going to happen. Aren't you some stupid mouth breather who is telling us for 10 years that inflation is going to happen after the printing? Don't you know, Ben Bernanke proved inflation can never happen, right? Every zero hedge guy was wrong for 10 years. You'll be wrong for an 11th. Inflation is transitory. We need to stimulate. We need to recover from COVID. It's a Biden boom, baby. Build back better. This was everything that they were saying, just to show you that I'm not imagining this. Here. Um... Yeah, while you're looking that up, I mean, the Treasury's also implicitly admitted this, too, with the introduction of the buyback program next year. Yes. And I'm rolling out. That's right. I know that so, I know there's not going to be demand. Here we go. So this guy is like, oh, nonsense, that the, the, the interest rate shock. Rate rises weren't that big, and they weren't a shock. The Fed telegraphed every move it made. This is completely false, right? Here. Back in March 2021, stop worrying about inflation. Inflation fear lurks. Fed Powell downplays inflation risks as Yellen foreshadows future spending. And then, boom, to the moon, right? Fastest rate hike in relative terms ever, right? In one year, higher than it had been in the last 10 years. Everybody was not positioned for this. Basically, what happened was, and, and you know, part of the, the skeleton key on this is... Um, Here. Essentially, the establishment lured banks into binging on bonds, right? This is what happened in. So in 2021, this is August 2021, banks are binging on bonds, but not because they want to. Look at that. They're taking out these massive positions in, in government debt because all the printing meant that the normal commercial loan supply was pushed down. So look at this enormous gap, right? They're taking tons of, even the New York Times saying, not because they want to. And uh, Powell was saying, even until November 3rd, 2021, Fed is patient on hikes, can act on inflation if needed. So they're fooling people and saying, look, take out huge positions in these bonds. We're not going to be changing interest rates for a while. And we don't think that inflation, you know, action is, is necessary. 
but they lied. Fed lied, banks died, right? That's literally what happened. Fed lied, banks died, trust the Fed, end up dead. Every institution that bet big on U.S. government bonds in mid-2021 is a dead man walking to first order, right? Depending on how big a position they took, okay? And the thing is that these are considered, these are like the supposedly the backbone of the whole system. These are the things that, you know, what do they call it? Risk-free rate of return, right? The safest asset in the world, the U.S. Treasury, it has no risk of default. And everybody will say this, they'll repeat these things like stupid mantras, it has no risk of default. Okay, yeah, maybe they'll print the money to give it back, but they've literally just, first of all, they devalued it dramatically. Everybody today is like, oh, they're experienced bankers. They should have known about duration risk. Nobody in mid-2021 was saying, um, oh, okay, the Fed is going to hike rates to a historical level. The Fed was lying about this the entire time. Here, I'll show you just like... Um, Look at this. Basically, it's like, hold on. You've got to have master Twitter search skills to be able to pull these uh, up. And, uh... Yeah. It's an art form, not a science, the Twitter search. <laughs> Here we go. Basically, this post summarizes it, right? Just as in 2008, the bankers lied, okay? Uh, this time, the central bankers, the banks, the bank regulators have lied to all dollar holders and depositors. And fundamentally, what happened is um, the Fed and the Treasury tricked institutions into buying huge amounts of bonds and then devalued them, sticking them with gigantic losses. And we're talking like historical losses, right? We're talking, this is just, you know, the unrealized, you know, loss and gains up until Q4 2022. Just look at these absolutely massive hundreds of billions of dollars in losses, right? These are all caused by the Fed totally U-turning on the policy and sticking these guys with, with the bill, right? And, and this is across, you know, this is the big banks, here's the community banks, they show similar losses, right? And by the Fed itself, because paying out all of this interest um, it's not quote, profitable anymore. The entire system is just totally, totally, totally broken. And, um, and it's breaking in more visible ways. And so, um, as I said, they make it intentionally complicated. But once you realize that treasuries are the new toxic waste and treasuries are the backbone of this entire system, then, um, you know, you can, you can go further on that. I can, I can show you pensions and insurance, you know, like AIG and how AIG went bust in 2008, like yeah. lots of insurance companies bought tons of bonds because they're the safest thing, right? So they all got destroyed. And as rates keep going up, because they look like they're going to keep going up, they get more destroyed. And they hope that nobody comes asking for the money. Because if they do come asking for the money, then they have to get printed money from the Fed to back it up. And, uh, you know, of course, what happens is when, when this is, you know, we've got this weird thing that's happening where rates are being hiked still. And then banks are dying as a consequence, and the Fed selectively prints to just help these guys. Somebody called it rate apartheid, where <laughs> the average Joe is crushed by both high inflation and high rates. Means, you know, like their, their mortgage, all, if they had an adjustable rate mortgage or something like that, you know, they're toast. But lots of other things they're toast on. They don't have the pull to get the selective printed money of this BTFP program, right? So... It is an absolute disaster, and it's also it's on top of, you know, this mortgage crisis. Actually, I've got a pinned tweet, which is, uh, you know, it's a video that I go through all of this on, right? So you can kind of look at that. But the uh, j just to quickly summarize, I've got a if you go to balgs.com front slash fiat, okay, um, and I've got a bunch of links here, but um, it's like here. <clears throat> What did I call it? It's, an, it's a banking crisis, municipal budget crisis, because the blue states are bankrupt, bond crisis, commercial real estate crisis. That, you know, just that alone, by the way. Um, here, I'll show you one more visual of this. That's, as you're saying this too, I'm actually reminded, because as all this is going on, you have banks consolidating up into the big four, predominantly JP Morgan. Yes. Okay. And yeah. 
like if you remember in 2019 the repo spasm that fall was driven by the fact that jp morgan rotated out of cash and into treasuries particularly so i don't actually so, know that part of the story um I wasn't I wasn't paying as close attention then to this particular aspect. So t tell me your your vantage point on the 2019. Well, thing. what I'm wondering now, just as we're having this conversation, is like, is there just a massive amount of projection? Like J.P. Morgan's the safest bank in the world. And yes. They actually yeah. did that huge rotation in 2019. They're still sitting on those treasuries, and it's actually just a big con game where they're trying to make everybody feel like they're, they're safe, safe in the safest bank, well, but they're sitting on uh, all. I mean, they're safe in the sense of like they're going to try to become like the Bank of America. And what, what, what's essentially happened is there's like this 30 odd too big to fail globally systemically important banks worldwide. We saw what happened when, when it too big to fail fails with Credit Suisse failed. It was pretty messy, right? Yeah, depositors evidently kept their money, but it was absolute mess and they had to like violate every law in Switzerland and destroy Switzerland's reputation as a financial capital in order to quote, save Credit Suisse, right? So that's like what happens when a quote too big to fail fails. It's not fail fail, but it's, it's pretty bad. And um, what coming back to the thing about like blue tribe, red tribe, if you analyze the banking system tribally, they've set it up in the following way. The gray banks can go to zero or they can die. Like basically you can have chaos envelop uh, the, you know, SVB and, and First Republic and so on. The red banks can also die uh, in a different way where um, the red banks get access to this BTFP program that the gray banks didn't, but their deposits are leaving anyway and they're going to money market funds and so on, okay? And, and to the big banks. But the blue banks get all deposits, right? So you've just set it up, whether intentionally or not, such that the, the big four blue controlled banks get all of the deposits in the entire banking system and all of the community red banks are choked out and the tech banks are choked out. And best of all, you have some reds getting mad at grays when it has absolutely nothing to do with tech whatsoever and it's 100% with the Fed. Like this is, this is just something where everybody bought bonds and it so happens that like, uh, you know, one way of thinking about it is, you know, Powell keeps talking about a soft landing, soft landing, mm -hmm. right? Well, that means Powell's a pilot. It's a metaphor he himself has chosen. Powell is a pilot of the plane. He's crashing the plane. And SVB and others were like, guys were just positioned near the front of the plane. But everybody's going <laughs> to, everybody who's still in this plane is going to get crushed. They're going to crash unless you have like the Bitcoin parachute or outside money of some kind and get the hell out. Right. Yeah. This also, by the way, lots of people, man, you're probably aware of this, but there's there's a, quite a few people who will get mad at you for pointing this stuff out. Have you noticed oh, yes. that? Oh, yes. <laughs> and they're like, why do you why do you hate America so much if you're you and, and I'm like. Powell, why does Jerome Powell hate America so much? Why does the Fed hate America so much? It's like saying, you know, uh, the guys who got the U.S. to invade Iraq hate America so much, not the people who are against it. Right. The, the Fed hates America so much, not the people who are against the Fed destroying you. We are just literally the passengers on the plane who are observing that the pilot is crashing the plane. Yeah, the wings and on people, fire. Like, yeah. Hey. And, and people are mad that you're pointing it out. You know, go ahead. Give me your thoughts on that. I mean, it's just cognitive dissonance is rampant. People don't want to believe it. That's the other thing. It's like a fish in water. People have grown up in the system operating a certain way and operating somewhat functionally. They don't want to recognize that it's dysfunctional. I actually, you know, I, I actually reduced it to maybe two premises and you might, you might try this on, uh, may not, may not guess because maybe, cause they might be there, but so I actually put out a tweet and maybe you saw this, but does the U S have, um, so can the U S print infinite money? Does the U S have an invincible military? Right. Do you agree with the first premise, the second premise, both or neither? Uh, I don't believe an invincible military. I do believe they can print as much money as possible. Well, OK, so uh, what I'm, uh, of course, they can. But uh, I, really what it means is without consequence. Oh, no, I don't believe either. Then. OK, right. So, I mean, it's just like a tweet. So it was like I had to uh, I had to be 
uh, to be compact, right? But the, the premise is, can it print infinite money without consequence? Because the MMT people believe it can print infinite money without consequence, right? And here, to my surprise, maybe some people read it the way that you just did, right? But can the U.S. print infinite money? Does the U.S. have an invincible military? And maybe it's a phrasing, but I was actually a little surprised that only like a little less than 45% of my audience said no to both. Most people agreed, like 30% of people thought that it had an invincible military. Yeah. No, okay. Actually, I mean, I had a, an intelligence officer analyst, excuse me, on a few weeks ago. It was after that conversation where it really drove home, like our military is not invincible. Like we wanted to do a ground war in Ukraine, or if we wanted to do something in Taiwan to protect them, we literally don't have the training or the weaponry capabilities to do that either of those things, I, let alone both. I mean, the thing about this is everybody is forming their opinions. So, uh, you know, the first thing you'll get when you talk about this or even look at this is, oh, you're an expert in the military now after being an expert in X and Y and Z, ha ha ha, right? And the thing is, are the military guys actually experts at the military? Because uh, Iraq and Afghanistan are massive losses, series of massive loss. It's like the entire Middle Eastern wars the last 20 years have been gigantic losses. Maybe you can fire a gun, but can you book a win? No, they couldn't, right? Or at least they didn't even know what a win was. Like, what is a political resolution? War is politics better than means. I was just tweeting about this. Like, what was a political resolution of that conflict? It turned out Assad won. It turned out the Taliban won, right? It turned out that... Uh, you know, bin Laden even achieves objectives in the sense of burning $8 trillion in the desert. Iraq is now selling oil in Yuan to China. Uh, Iran is not isolated. They're with Saudi, blah, 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 blah. Essentially, it's like a total, total strategic defeat for the U.S. militarily. That's why if the U.S., I mean, look, if it's Dwight Eisenhower, of course. I'm not going to say anything about the military with respect to, I mean, he's obviously booking wins, right? If... It's kind of like, uh, you know, if, if I felt it's like during COVID, you know, did if, if they were doing a good job, would you care whether, you know, what Fauci was saying? You know, the, like during swine flu, did anybody really care? Nobody really cared. Right. Um, they were still like a functional establishment at that time. OK. Um, point is, I'm not sure there is like a Western military expert in the sense of someone who's like winning wars. Right. I would listen to somebody who is. I don't know, part of Operation Desert Storm 1, maybe, right? Uh, but that's a long time now, right? 30 years ago. It's, uh, the information is absolutely A. B is, given that, like, certain kinds of... So what is observable? What's observable is $8 trillion lost in Iraq and Afghanistan. Total defeat in the Middle Eastern wars, right? And just to, just to kind of show that, um, I, will, I went through this thread on this. Let me... Sh sh I'll show you two threads. Oops. Have I projected more than anybody else in the history of the podcast? <laughs> we, Maybe. I, up um, there, definitely. Up there. Okay. So here's the war on terror retrospective. Eight trillion spent. Iraq is now trading in Yuan. Assad won the Syrian civil war. Afghanistan is controlled by the Taliban. Saudi and Iran aligned against the U.S. Millions dead and displaced. What's the conclusion? Fight Russia and China next. <laughs> right? This it's is insane. absolutely, it's insane. Okay. But just to show, here is the eight trillion and 900K deaths. All right. Here is Iraq is now settling in Yuan. Not yet oil, but everything else. Assad has won the Syrian civil war, and the U.S. threatened sanctions on countries that renormalized relations, but seems not to have worked. The Taliban now controls Afghanistan. Blinken calls on them to do things they are ignored. China brokers peace between Saudi and Iran. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> U.S. is completely frozen out. And surprised by the deal, and and like the CIA guy Burns actually is mad at Saudi for making peace here, and of course tens of millions of people dead and displaced by this insane set of wars. Right after all this, we are suddenly taking on China and Russia at the same time. Okay, now I mean the thing is, all this stuff was sold with fake news, literal government conspiracies saying that there were weapons of mass destruction, and all these attacks on patriotism. And, you know, so this is something where basically, I mean, if, if 
just, I mean, this is such a massive cost. There's absolutely zero reflection on this whatsoever, right? So this is kind of the second point is, um, you know, the first is just, are there military experts, right? And relatedly, you know, this, this war was just massively lost and uh, we, sh we should reflect on that, right? There's total strategic loss, total, I mean, it just caused death and destruction with absolutely no benefit to anybody, right? So, I mean, one, one way of thinking about it, by the way, is it's actually relatively easy. J just blowing something up is, uh, destroying is not actually power. You know why? It's like, if you have, let's say there's a house, and you tell, and you've got a crowd in front, and you tell 100 people, go and burn down that house. You know what? BLM showed that some, you know, Blue America, they can still execute on that. Okay, one guy grabs a bottle, one guy grabs a rock, smash windows, thing is on fire, it's ashes by, you know, 9 p.m., okay? But if you tell that group of 100 people to go build a house, that's a lot harder. First of all, they mm -hmm. might not be able to do it, you need a foreman, you need like, you know, blueprints, you need lumber, it has to go in in such a place. And that's because destruction paralyzes, right? Everybody can go in and destroy something without coordinating with anybody else. And you have no, you need no experience, you can grab a piece of wood and just start hitting the wall or something like that, right? So destruction is easy, it's anarchic. Building is so much harder, it's a thousand x harder, 10,000, 100,000 x harder. We're very fortunate that it's profitable. But there's a huge number of people who mistake the fact that America still ha can blow things up for the idea that it's still, quote, powerful in the true sense of power, which is to be able to build something. You know, just still being, lots of things, a lot of people can blow things up and kill people, cause chaos, cause anarchy, cause shooting. There's a million ways to smash glass into pieces, to, to smash a country into civil war. It's much harder to keep it together, right? And so there's like a juvenile kind of rightist or militarist or whatever who thinks that the fact that you can still blow things up indicates that there's still some power there. Actually, that's like the last bit of power. You know what I'm that's saying? It's a whole right? might is right thing. It's like, yeah. It's might is right, but it's also something where it's like, um, it's, it's, it's fleeting because it's like the Soviet Union at the end. They would just drop arms into conflict zones. I mean, that's what I say. The USSA today is like the USSR, where it would drop arms and slogans into conflict zones, but it couldn't build, right? I mean, the US during the Cold War built up West Germany. It built up South Korea. It helped build up, um, you know, Taiwan and Hong Kong, right? Well, the communists on the other side did a terrible job, right? They, they, they drove their population into dirt. The U.S. helped build them up. That was the good U.S. Now, the U.S. is like the USSR then, where it just shouts slogans and, and it gives democracy and, and hands out rifles and everybody shoots each other in Syria and they, they foment chaos. And now others, what's happening is now there's peace in the Middle East. Now the U.S. is being driven out of the region, basically. Right? That's the insane thing that's happening. The U.S. was actually pushing for Saudi to not make peace with Iran. The U.S. was pushing for Syria to not make peace with the Arab League. But now the U.S. is being pushed back. And no one cares what the U.S. has to say. So there's now peace in the Middle East. So the U.S. is actually part of the fomenter of chaos. So I know that sounds like, oh, my God, you hate the U.S. That's not actually, you know, like the thing is the empire. One way of thinking about it is there's like imperial core, right? Like the imperial center. There's like. A lot of Americans who are drafted in different senses of the term, you know, into various roles to support that. And there's like the victims of empire around the world. And it, the empire is just not doing good things abroad. A lot of Democrats used to be able to see that. A lot of Republicans can see that it's not doing good things at home. And then when you have binocular vision, you can kind of see both. Right. Yeah. Um, go ahead. You're going to say. No, that's the most frustrating thing about being an American citizen right now is the fact is the fact that nobody wants to recognize the objective truth of what you just described. Like we're losing consistently. We're expanding, trying to expand our empire military might certainly too quickly spreading ourselves thin, not getting wins anywhere and yet doubling and tripling down literally insane, literally you doubling know? and tripling down. That's right. And, and the thing about that is, um, there's still a lot that is, there's still a lot of individual Americans that are highly admirable. So here's, by the way, some other stats. So I just showed the Afghanistan numbers, right? Um, and, and all the Middle East numbers. Here's some, something more, right? This is this great cartoon. Uh, you know, first, let me tell you, uh, you know, the law is powerless to help you. And then she gets arrested. She's like, I thought you said the law is powerless. 
powerless to help you, not punish you, right? That's an arco tyranny, okay? So a de declining state has trouble building a bus lane, but it can still destroy someone's life, okay? And just, as, just to show you this, like, for example, literal combat ship, I'm not sure if you can see this, okay? Uh, 23 ships cost around 500 million to build, astronomical operating costs, cost overruns, delays, mechanical failures, right? Okay, the Navy's $13 billion supercarrier still can't do the one thing it's absolutely required to do. What good is an aircraft carrier that can't reliably launch and land aircraft, okay? How about this? Uh, you know, there's, there's just so much um, there on this. Hold on, there's more. Um, there's a few more, actually. So here are, basically, it's just not the same country, right? World War II America could make a B-24 bomber in 60 minutes. 2022 America needs 20 years to reopen a bathroom. It's just not the same country, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's like, um, here's, you know, F-35 is a failure, massively expensive. Um, there's, there's so many of these things where, you know, so I just mentioned literal combat ship, Zumwalt, four class air carriers, F-35. I'm sure there's people who are, quote, procurement experts or whatever who could give a longer list. But the, the same government that's doing the $300 million bus lanes, that's doing, you saw the La Sombrita, the, the bus, bus shade, right? Yep. The toilet paper ribbon cutting. Do you remember that in San Francisco? Yep, yep. Right? <laughs> um, here. It's idiocracy uh, in real time. It's like, it's, it's actually, it is idiocracy, right? And here I was like, um, so for the last 12 years, Blue America has been in total control of California. What is their greatest accomplishment in the field of public infrastructure? Solar powered metal pole, okay? Toilet paper ribbon cutting. Literally they had a, this is like a state senator. They had a press conference to celebrate the opening of a one stall bathroom with all these people there. For them, that was like the moon landing. And you know what they're doing with their fingers? They're cutting a toilet paper ribbon. <laughs> okay. Crack smoking billboard. Okay, have you seen these? These are in San Francisco. Yes, yes. Injecting drugs carries the highest risk of overdose, so try smoking or snorting instead. Let's take care of each other, San Francisco, right? And $300 million bus lane, right? 27 years, $300 million for like a, like a, like a bus lane. Now, actually, what is their greatest accomplishment? None of these are the greatest accomplishment. The greatest accomplishment is the $100 billion high-speed rail project. 15 years later, not a single mile of track laid. Okay. Where is all that money gone? It's a great question. And it's probably legal graft, which is to say it's like bureaucracies and environmental impact projects where it's all legal, but it's just right. The point is, if you can't build a bus stop, you can't stop China. It's like, <laughs> it's like duh, right? You're, you're, you're fighting your factory, you know? And I... Uh, of course, you know, look, what I just gave were A, numbers on like the entire Middle Eastern disaster, B, numbers on construction, civil construction, and C, numbers on military construction, like the Zumwalt and the aircraft carriers and, and, and so on, right? The four class carriers and, and all this stuff. We also have D, which is uh, the US is effectively suing for peace in Ukraine. We'll see what happens on that, right? But you're seeing articles like um, here. I'll show you a few of them. So. Uh, as you lay it out like this, it's all. It's like Go taking ahead. the black pill. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> But, <laughs> but it's like, that's just the frustrating thing, especially that's why I focus on Bitcoin is like, I recognize all this, but I've never laid it out in <laughs> as elaborately as you have over the last three hours, connecting all the dots. And it's just making me want to double and triple down and just like exiting via Bitcoin. So, so that's the thing is basically, 
Um, if I have if I have one message for your audience, I think it is. Look, obviously, I believe in Bitcoin. You believe in Bitcoin. Let me let me just pause this for a second. Um, I think it, it's really though three things. It's allocation, location, organization, right? So allocation is yeah, financially, you know, I actually like uh, um, Odell's thing, like uh, be humble and stack sets, stay humble and stack sets, right? Mm -hmm. Where God knows what's going to happen, right? So stay humble and stack sets, actually a pretty good slogan. I like that, you know. Um, and um, so allocation, that's kind of, I mean, you, you can also ask further, okay. Uh, beyond Bitcoin, what else? Well, some people, some people like gold. Obviously, some people like other cryptocurrencies. Um, but I think Bitcoin will be a shelling point in all of this. A, in terms of other fiat currencies, like the Swiss franc used to be a stable safe haven. It's not anymore. Switzerland isn't. And uh, you know, I think maybe um, you know some combination of Dubai, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand is interesting for fiat because. Um, you know, Dubai's currency is pegged to the dollar, okay, but it's like, a, you know, maybe they would unpeg it. And those four countries are the ones that are attracting like global millionaires and what have you, right? So other people have done diligence on them. So since you have to hold like some balance in fiat, that might be a place. You could also, of course, hold a half in USD and half BTC or whatever it is you want to do or whatever. I, I'm not, no financial advice there. I'm just saying, okay, that's allocation. Location, I think, is less talked about. Location, um, I would basically get out of blue states in my view. Um, and the reason is blue states are massively bankrupt. Um, blue states will be like the center of like the gravitational vortex, like if and when they do try to print gigantic amounts of money, and they're kind of already started on this. Uh, and there's, you know, they've talked about this treasury buyback thing in early 2024. I showed you several of these different crises. I mentioned um, the bond crisis, I showed the commercial real estate crisis. Uh, but it's, um, it's also, um, Auto loans, it's a trillion dollar thing. Credit card crisis is nearing a trillion. Medical debt, student loans, payments are gonna start again. Insurance crisis, trade wars cost hundreds of billions of dollars. Europe has spent 800 billion on the energy crisis. Um, and then of course there's Ukraine, that's another 100, I mean, $100 billion is so much money. <laughs> it's like, and it's like, uh, Every single thing of these I mentioned is like a hundred billion to a trillion or more. Well, that fact's being like desensitized. Everybody's being desensitized to that. You just throw around billions, hundreds of billions, trillions, willy nilly. I, and I know, but it's also like, I mean, one way to just bring it back to earth is, I mean, look, you and I have funded companies, built companies. I know how hard it is. Like even in the, I compare the last 10, look, it's hard to build companies, just like it's hard to dunk a basketball. But the last uh, 15 years has sort of, especially the last three, not, not 2022, but like especially 2021 was like dunking on the moon. Okay, it's hard to dunk, but on the moon, you can jump a lot higher, mm -hmm. right? So they were giving anti-gravity and a lot of companies, especially in 2021, were just like dunking the ball that couldn't otherwise, right? Um, point is though, that basically if you, I mean, a hundred, hundred billion dollars, that's like, that's like a hundred unicorns. It's really hard to build a unicorn, <laughs> even when you're dunking on the moon. Okay. It's hard to do that to a hundred of them, just like thrown into the wood chipper like that, you know, like, you know, a trillion dollars, that's a, that's a Google, right? And so, like, you know, there's five, I mean, maybe add NVIDIA, you could add Netflix, right? There's not that many great American tech companies. And that's actually where all of the stock market growth has been. Have you seen how, like, consolidated it's been this year? Everything else is sucking mm. wind. It's all in just those few companies, right? Massive concentration there. All these things that are found in the last 20, 30 years, right? All the old American brands are just still zombie companies, you know, because they've all just gotten bailed out. They're not, right? And so you take all of those giant tech companies and you throw them in the wood chipper and it still doesn't make a dent because Druckenmiller estimates, you know, Druckenmiller's thing is like, uh, if you add up all the entitlements, it's not a 30 trillion debt, it's 200 trillion. Mm -hmm. Like social security, all this stuff is not being booked. So there's absolutely no way to pay. Uh, moreover, like just on the Ukraine thing for a second, I'll show you three links. Um, oops. And that's, I mean, I did an interview yesterday 
too, talking about like the debt ceiling. And somebody had two young children. And that's what really scares me is like, if we keep kicking the can down the road. Well, like, I think for good or for ill, I think it's going to be resolved sooner than, <laughs> I don't think it's going to be, uh, of course, I may be wrong, but I don't think we've got a decade. I think it's going to be a giant crisis in, in sooner than later. But so here, for example, you see this, the West needs a new strategy in Ukraine, a plan for getting from the battlefield to the negotiating table. This is April because they're seeing the writing on the wall. Okay, this, this is a senior guy, Charles Kupchin, writing about this. You should read this article if you want. There's another one where Blinken is actually saying uh, that he would welcome um, China's role in uh, resolving the Ukraine war. And it's officially in the Washington Post. So that's like a, you know, regime, a regime outlet. And uh, it just warms to a role for China in resolving the Ukraine war because Zelensky went to China. And what, the, what Blinken definitely doesn't want is China you know, negotiating the Ukraine-Russia peace deal without the U.S. involved. Yes, by themselves. Which is possible, right? Just like the Saudi-Iran deal was, right? The predicate for any effort. So that's why he's like, potential American and Chinese cooperation. Here's the thing. This alone means the world is not unipolar, right? Just it's the fact mission. that... It's an admission of that. Asked about working with it. In principle, there's nothing wrong with that. If we have a country, you know, we'd welcome that. It's certainly possible, blah, blah, blah. You know, so, and then there's this uh, really good lecture, actually. Um, it's funny because it's quite good, and yet it has, I think, incorrect conclusions. Yet still, I'll take it. So Greenwald talked about this. I cannot recommend highly enough the speech delivered by longtime anti-Russia hawk and U.S. foreign policy elite Fiona Hill. She prescribes how and why Ukraine has become a full-scale worldwide revolt against the U.S.-led order. Okay, it's a Lenart Mary lecture, 2023, by Fiona Hill. Now, this whole lecture, honest, it's, it's rare that I say like actually read every line, but there's like 30 lines in this that are very quotable, simply because, I mean, they're actually well, it's well written, but simply because it's coming from somebody who is an extreme establishment figure, like, you know, Russiagate, all this type of stuff, this is her, right? And so here's just some of her lines. The war in Ukraine is perhaps the event that makes the passing of Pax Americana apparent to everyone, okay? Um, and uh, the rest of the world seeks to cut down the U.S. to a different size in their neighborhoods they want to decide, not be told what's in their interest. In short, in 2023, we hear a resounding no to U.S. domination and marked appetite for a world without a hegemon. Now, by the way, there's plenty of Republicans who agree with this, and they're like, you know what? Let's stop sending our people to die overseas and spending all this money on foreign wars. Let's just take care of our own people. And there's plenty of Democrats who used to say something similar, which is let's stop killing all these people overseas and let's instead go and, you know, build up our own roads and bridges and whatnot, right? So there's been that Jeffersonian impulse within the U.S. And I think that's going to hope, I mean, hopefully, I think that's likely to happen after Russia and hopefully it doesn't escalate to war with China. And I think actually you might see like U.S. financial collapse before it escalates because it's gone from like Iraq and Afghanistan to Russia. And then everyone's like, and then we'll fight China next. I think the system might come apart before then, but we'll see. Um, so here we are. So the next iteration will not be framed by the United States alone. It's not an order or a disorder. It's like a range of countries. Or the, it's basically everybody's having like local orders and little deals, right? Regionalization. So like little, you know, it's like the Southeast Asian nations and the Latin American nations work amongst themselves, right? Um, and there's a few other really key points here. Um, and da, 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 blah, blah, blah. This is all just Putin stuff. Right. Can so it, yeah. see, the Ukraine war highlights the decline of the U.S. itself. This decline is relative economically and military, but serious in terms of U.S. moral authority. She even admits like bin Laden won. As bin Laden intended, after the 9-11 attacks, uh, their, their own reactions have eroded its position. Right. And, uh, you know, for some, the U.S. is a flawed international actor. Basically, many, many countries don't look at the U.S. as a model because it's got endless, it's got BLM riots and, you know, like the capital stuff and, you know, Jan 6. And it's got all of this fighting Everybody's constantly. Everybody's fat. Everybody's unhealthy. 
yeah, it's, it's like it's basically like, and here this is this is you know the problem is people will hear this and they'll be like, oh my god, why do you hate America? So that's not where it's coming from. It's basically like that's hard love. Like if you actually love America, you want to be confronted. Yeah, it's this. A, it's like it's like it's like basically somebody who said in 1977, 1978 to China, hey, you know, this like 30 years of communism, you just killed millions of your own people, destroyed your economy. Um, like it's it's not that bad yet, uh, of course, but getting China off of communism was tough love and positive for China and getting America off of empire um, is it's like I mean here's what I think actually happens okay I think it's probably going to be maybe similar to the fall of the USSR where I kind of I, I feel the events of March um, are underappreciated in terms of how big they are because banks. Uh, go ahead it's the it's bank the values. ABC well it's ABC AI banking China are the ABCs mm -hmm. of economic apocalypse or AI Bitcoin China right. And uh, the reason for that is AI takes blue America's jobs, Bitcoin takes their power over money, and China just takes their power militarily. And so they were already kind of on the ropes, and now they're just getting hit by three very powerful forces at the same time. And then, of course, like Russia is also at least fighting to a standstill in Ukraine, if, even if not winning, and not losing is a win for Russia in some ways, right? So... I mean, one of the things is, it is possible to disrespect the establishment publicly without being canceled in a way that is just completely impossible even three years ago, right? It's like it gave its all in terms of propaganda and shrieked, but it's just kind of fallen off on that, right? And people aren't listening. You can tell that people have tuned out from the regime and so on. It's like a, it's like a change in wavelength. It doesn't mean they don't still have loyalists. They do. But what I foresee Here's the key thing that most people aren't thinking about. When, you know, when the Soviet Union broke up, do you know the first countries that broke away? Mm. Not the Baltics. Is it? Yeah. A, yeah. That's right. I mean, well, actually, arguably, it's a Warsaw Pact that the rattling happened because, you know, formally there's the Soviet Union and then there's the, uh, the Warsaw Pact countries that were nominally their own countries that were a little bit less under central control. So the rattling happened on the outskirts of empire first, and those broke away first, right? Um, and that's kind of like France today breaking away and going to you know work with China or whatever. That kind of thing is, right? But um, here, just to show you this, so basically, this is the key thing. The countries that exited the ruble the earliest, namely the Baltic states, performed the best, while the laggards suffered the most. Okay? Last guy out pays all the debts. That's an incentive to leave, right? So the Baltics were small. Can you see the screen? Yep. Yeah, so Baltics were small. They were first to exit the Soviet Union. They showed it was possible, and everyone followed suit. And the thing is, even... As late as March 1991, the USSR held this fake referendum, which they tried to show 76% support. They were doing fake votes. 76% support for staying in the Soviet Union, right? This was a vote they held to try to stem the tide. But you can see these black, you know, things over there. Basically, um, these, these regions rejected the, the all-union vote. They held their own. And... Because the Baltics broke away, they showed it was possible, and then the whole thing came apart like in like nine months, okay? And the thing is, this is key. When the Baltics left the USSR, they got a fresh start. They didn't inherit any of the foreign debt, okay? The Baltic Republics inherited neither the, the debt nor the claims for the assets of the USSR. So if Florida or Texas or the red states as a group or some subset of them break away first, they don't inherit the 30 trillion in debt. They get a clean start. That is the economic incentive on, I think, which the union breaks. And I think basically what you get are, I think you know one thing that could catalyze it is if in Florida and Texas, they've reopened the gold window or the digital gold window, like 
for example, here's just a thought experiment. You could imagine bitcoin.florida.gov, okay? And so at a, at a gov website. And it's like 2013 Coinbase. So it's just buy, sell, send, and receive Bitcoin. That's it. And um, it has its own little order book, okay? This is like an exchange that's run by the state, just like a gold window used to be run by the state. You know, you could literally go to the gold window and like exchange your dollars for gold. So you run this digital gold window. And the crucial thing about it is it works with state chartered banks. Okay, it works with, because DeSantis has talked about having state chartered banks bank crypto because the feds are harassing all mm -hmm. of these, you know, banks that are banking crypto. So that's the second banking system in the US, the state chartered banks. He can order them or tell them that you have to bank crypto companies. Right. And other red states can follow suit. And now the Fed is put in a tough position because either they can blink and allow DeSantis and others to do this, or they can say, hey, I'm going to cut off ACH, SWIFT and other things to the state chartered banks. But that shows their hand. It shows what the oppression of a CBDC would be. And it's a pretty big step to try to unbank Florida. Yeah. Right. That's a lot of collateral damage. I don't think they would do that. I think it would, it would force their hand in a useful way, right? So you, you make the state charter banks real. And so if he did that, and if other states followed suit, well, what happens? Well, Fed blinks. Now you can do ACH, SWIFT, WIRE, et cetera, into a Florida state charter bank. Maybe you open a bank account there. Maybe you have to be a Florida resident. Maybe it's easier to do this in red states. You have to be, it's like local banking again. Now you've got a reason to bring some of your deposits back to local banks. So all the deposits are flying up to the big blue banks. Now you've got a reason to bring them back to red banks. That's big, right? You've got a, you've got a revenue stream for those red banks because these trades are happening. Uh, you also have a revenue stream for the state where it can take, let's say, I don't know, half a percent, 1%, whatever they think is reasonable of transactions, and they start accumulating a Bitcoin position of the state of Florida, right? Yeah. And the exchange itself it might be set up where it's like, I don't know, a $10 fee to hold your coins on the exchange. They don't want you to hold your coins on exchange. You're supposed to take your coins off the exchange, right? It's like like a parking space. It's like intended to be cash and carry. Just get it off the exchange. It's not meant to be custodial, okay? So like by having a daily fee, you incentivize people to remove their assets, right? So it's engineered different than all the other custodial exchanges. It's meant to be get your Bitcoin, get out. Now that order book can take the liquidity from the public Coinbase and Binance and Kraken and other order books, but it can also share liquidity with the Texas order book and the El Salvador order book and other government order books as they set them up, right? And in this fashion, like, have you ever seen the movie Pacific Rim? Mm hmm Right? So the reason I bring it up is when these giant monsters, you're like, why does it come from? Come out of the these, water. Yeah, these giant monsters come out of the water. Humans can't fight them. They need to build giant robots, right? So when this giant monster of the federal government comes out of the water, a normal company can't fight it. You need another state. You need Florida. You need Texas, right? You need El Salvador. You need Oklahoma. You need UAE, right? Basically, both red states and purple states and foreign states can stand up to these federal regulators. They've got way more hit points, right? They've got the legitimacy also. You know, they represent a lot of people. It's a much tougher battle, right? And so if those red and purple states can keep that digital gold window open, here's where things get really interesting. Going back to that USSR analogy, at the very, very, very end of the, US, end of the USSR, they finally had the true vote. Because, you know, the Soviets, they, all, they, they pretended to represent the people. They talked about democracy all the time, right? And the true vote at the end was not the vote against a communist, it was a vote against communism. It was basically like these people, even though the Soviets, like they tried to tear down posters and stuff like that, a fair vote was held and it was so overwhelmingly against communists that they couldn't fake it and they lost and they were out of power. The first vote that had been held really in 70 years. Now, I think the equivalent of that that happens in the US and in the West more generally, all the stuff, you know, like the DXY, do you know what that is? Yeah, it's like uh, the Dixie dollar index. All, in my view, all that is fake because it's like the dollar versus the yen and a, bu a bunch of other currencies where um, they're they're basically U.S. protectorates, right? So the only true trading pair in the world is USD BTC, or arguably maybe there's three. There's there's USD RMB, RMB BTC, 
or rather, let's say USD CNY or the, the foreign version CNH or there. Um, so dollar yuan, yuan Bitcoin, Bitcoin dollar. Those are like the three poles of the world, right? Where they've got billion person economies or whatever underneath them in theory, okay? It's like 400 million crypto holders or something like that. And the true vote at the end of this regime, in my view, is Bitcoin just going vertical. That's actually the real election because just like the communists purported to represent the people, the capitalists purport to be a free market. And when that free market votes against the Fed, and the Fed buy Bitcoin, when all these Republicans realize that they can't boycott every single store, but they can boycott Bitcoin, right? Yep. When all these Democrats, with the, the, the disaffected Democrats, the guys like, you know, RFK, you know, they're realizing, oh, actually, uh, you know, if we, if we want a future without, you know, with, with civil liberties and without censorship and so on, you can't just vote in a new government that's going to do that, you need to decentralize and go to local and state governments. There are local and state Democrats who, who want that, who are not like the, the federal Democrats. So as those disaffected Republicans, disaffected Democrats do this, they rally behind BTC. And if the USD BTC price moons, that indicates a vote of no confidence in the Fed. Because after all, Powell is a real president, right? Even Bill Clinton has said the Federal Reserve Chair is more powerful than the president. Mm -hmm. And did you ever vote for him? No one ever did. Have you ever been able to vote against him? Now you can. And the Fed before it ends you. And I think that is actually how the whole thing winds up. Because as BTC starts really going vertical, as that printing goes crazy, blues will try everything they can to shut down the exit from the system. And the way to understand this, by the way, is like, do you know what Checkpoint Charlie was? No. Okay. So... Um, basically, all of these failing states um, try to bar the exit. So here, let me show you. All of these failing states, let me see if I can find this. Yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, you can't vote for the Fed. It's a private institution. So you have to fight over private money. Exactly. So, so the first true vote, just like the, the Soviets had the first true vote in 70 years, right, since the 1910s, this is the first true vote that Americans will have. It's like if in, two, in 2008 you couldn't vote against the bailouts, right, you couldn't have a forked parallel system where you opted out of what they were doing. Now you can if the states can keep the USD BTC window open. Right. And just to give you an analogy here, like basically one way of thinking about it is exit is like a fundamental human right. Right. So Article 13 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights says everyone has a right to leave any country, including his own. Do you see this? Right. To hop. OK. Mm -hmm. But it's not just moving your country. It's moving, you know, everything else. This is translated to 80 languages. Here's the thing. All of the really bad regimes block the exit. OK. For example, the Reich flight tax, okay? Anybody who is leaving Germany, you know, Jews who left Germany were robbed of their financial assets, okay? The diploma tax in the Soviet Union. Basically, uh, when Soviet Jews and others were trying to leave to the West, they tried to fine you 100 months of salary, okay? <laughs> um, in uh, East Germany, okay? Basically, they, they called Republiflucht, desertion from the Republic. You're an unpatriotic person if you tried to leave East Germany to go to West Germany. And in fact, the border wasn't secured. Millions of East Germans left. And so that's why they built the Berlin Wall to point the guns in and to keep people from leaving. And this is a famous you know, example of a soldier just leaping over the barbed wire of the Berlin Wall, the leap to freedom in Checkpoint Charlie. Okay, And of course, Cuba, a difficult task of exiting the island because everybody wants to get the hell out. Okay, And they have the so-called wet foot, dry foot policy where uh, if you're a Cuban and you are... Um, uh, you manage to, if, you, if you're caught in the water, you're returned back to Cuba. If you manage to make it to land, then you're okay. <laughs> and you can <laughs> apply for asylum, all right? So, which is just ridiculous policy, but whatever, that's what they ended up on. So the point is, all of these communist states, socialist states, um, failed states, they block the totalitarian states, they block the exits, 
they don't let you leave or they don't let you leave with your money or they just don't let you leave at all. Right. And so as you know, one way of thinking about it is, um, and here's one more piece of the puzzle, very important piece. Did I share the graph on who paid for 2008? This is like uh, a skeleton. You, key. Yeah. You Go DM'd ahead. it to me a couple okay, weeks ago. Let me put it up right. though, because it's really important. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll look at the transcript and I'll order some of these arguments because, you, you know, they're, they're all, uh, it's, it's consilient if you, and you see it all together. So did Republicans pay for 2008? All right. So here's, here's the graph. Let me first explain the graph. Can you see the graph there? Yep. Okay. So the solid line is that, so what are you seeing here? This is the uh, amount of um, GDP in a congressional district. So this is a congressional district that produces like 10 billion or less, 20 billion or less, and so on and so forth, okay? And in 2008, the solid line shows the outline, okay? And so in 2008, the the blue distribution of uh, congressional districts and the red distribution of congressional districts were pretty similar, right? The blue outline and the red outline look pretty similar. It means Democrats and Republicans were roughly socioeconomically similar. But by 2018, the blue dots have pulled way ahead of the red dots. Like here is the, the blue average is something like, or median is like 50 billion real GDP and the red median is like 30 billion GDP, which is a huge difference by the way, A. And B, all of the richest districts are blue, right? Mm. And so what happened was a gigantic shift in 10 years with red and blue being equally matched to suddenly blue having all the money, right? Yeah. So Republicans paid for 2008. We know that inflation is dilution, but it wasn't randomly distributed dilution. It went to the coasts first and the blues first and some poor like Oklahoman cashier got that printed dollar last because the candle in effect meant the blues got the money first. And, you know, the thing about this is 2000, 2009 to 2016 is a Democrat administration. And, you know, the whole thing was done in such a way that it was deniable and invisible. It's unconscious, probably, even to those doing the imposing. But it just so happens, like the cost of the print was imposed on the political opposition. Democrats became rich. Republicans suddenly became poor. And of course, this had knock on effects because all of this money then went to, you know, woke capital and it went to uh, blocking Republicans out of jobs and censoring them and so on and so forth. This also bit up housing prices. This is also what's caused, you know, student loans. And uh, there's, there's a bunch of different things which that printed money is really the, the, the plot of the entire 2010s. It's the actor behind everything. But once you realize actually, because Republicans were in the system and they couldn't exit the system, they got diluted by the system and they didn't know that they were. Is that pretty crazy? Had, it is. And then you had the shale bus going on during this too. So uh, yeah. oil and gas companies weren't making as much money. Yeah. Well, so, okay. So, I mean, fracking actually, didn't fracking happen in the mid-2010s? Like, that was like probably it, one thing that was going well for the Republicans during that time period. But it drove I don't know prices all the, down, though, so it went boom and bust. And, ah, okay. Got, all right. I've, I, I have not followed that very closely, so you're, I'll, I'll defer to you on that. But let me say, tell you something else. You know, there's another group, at least, that was diluted down and paid for 2008. You know who they were? Mm. Some of the Arabs. Why? Okay. Because food price spikes helped trigger Arab Spring. So yep. inflation was exported outside the U.S. And, uh, you know, it's one thing if, you know, you find that your cost of groceries is doubled. It's another thing for someone who's like close to subsistence. It's like too much, right? So that guy who set himself on fire who helped trigger the Arab Spring, the, you know, was doing it in part because of food prices. And so all these countries were pushed into chaos you know, Libya is still in chaos. And the thing about this is, um, yeah, ostensibly they got quote freedom out of this, but just think about this, right? Like inflation 
invisibly, deniably, was pushed to Republicans and to Arabs and to essentially those people who were like the official enemies, both at that time and in some ways today, right? And so once you realize that, you're like, oh, everybody who's within this system, the dollar holder is the bag holder. Because when they do this giant print, they're trying to bar the doors, you know, whether it's the Operation Choke Point that, um, that Nick Carter's talked about, whether it is um, just shutting down red banks and gray banks and consolidating the money at blue. Um, it's even they're going after fintech, as Caitlin Long has talked about. Mm -hmm. um, they're trying to roll out this Fed now and they call it not a CBDC when it's got all the functions of a CBDC. It's central bank digital control, even if it's not a central bank digital currency. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Yep. So because, it, 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 you know, just to show you that I wrote this post on this. And I was actually pleased to see that um, RFK Jr. actually quoted it and RT'd it um, because here, I think the reason is what they, what they always do, what the establishment always does is they change the words and they, they think that changes the meaning. So it's like, oh, Fed now, it's not a CBDC, therefore it's fine. And actually, no, because if you, look at the, if you look at their own documentation, can you see this visual? Yep. Fed now is in the middle of every single transaction everything. Yeah. of everything, right? So the sender, the sending uh, financial institution, the receiving financial institution, the receiver, all of them are now choke pointed through FedNow. Now, of course, there's some of this already with Fedwire, but it's not as granular. They're not seeing every transaction, all the metadata on it, A. And B, when you read their documentation, it's a little small, okay? But what does that say? Step three, okay? And, you know, th th they'll always basically lie until you can find the exact line in the documentation. Okay. And then when you find the exact line, here's what it says Hold on. Let me find the zoom in here a little bit. Step three, the fed now service validates payment message and complies with applicable controls. <laughs> Ta-da. In other words, they run code over that transaction and check the metadata to determine whether it's approved, right? Whether you are approved, whether your pattern of transactions is approved, whether like you can, I mean, you've got every data point here. You've got the sender, the sending, you can, you can do all kinds of stuff with this if you have that data set, right? So impose applicable controls. And then moreover, they talk about the different types of transactions and in, they include consumer to government and government to consumer. So consumer to government is your account can be drained, right? And government's consumer is they can do stimulus, boom, like that, airdrops. right? Just drop airdrops, exactly, helicopter money, right? So central bank, you know, Fed now, I, 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 point, I point, it's like a virus. This is what a lot of what they do is. It's a virus that has evolved to evade recognition by changing its sequence without changing its function. So you say, oh, Fed now, it's not a CBDC. Oh, then it must be okay. No, it's not okay. It's still central bank digital control, right? So... So essentially, the, 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 the full scope of what they've rolled out is, and again, I say it's like, it's like, you know, woke America is like chaotic evil. The communists were lawfully evil. Woke America is like chaotic evil. So it's not like, I'm not saying it's like coordinated because a lot of them are too dumb to, to, to know how to coordinate. It's, it's coordinated in the way I said. It's like tribal, you know. Every, every uh, actor is looking for what advantages blue, what attacks red and gray. So you put that all together, and what do you get? You get something where... Um, it's already hard for American citizens to like open foreign bank accounts. It's like a lot of reporting stuff, whatever. Um, a, B is uh, lots of red banks, gray banks are being shut down I I implicitly by having their funds move to money market funds or blue banks. The incentives have been set up for slow death. C, um, they have uh, they're going after crypto with checkpoints and stuff like that. D, they're rolling out Fed now. E, the Treasury buybacks. Have you seen that? Yep. Right. 2024. So treasury buyback. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. All right. Look, yeah, companies are not the same as governments. But if you take a company, a, um, a poor company has to pay high rates. If, it, if it's trying to, if, if you're a poor company, you don't have a lot of money and you go for a loan, you're going to get a high rate. A really rich company like Apple can borrow at low rates. And an insanely rich company like Apple, can do stock buybacks. But how the hell can you be both 
really poor and giving out high rates on your on your uh, you know on your loans and really rich at the same time, right? With what money is Treasury going to do these buybacks? You know, the, the entire stupid rule Goldberg system where you're issuing bonds. And of course, they're, they're saying, oh, all we're doing is changing the liquidity, you know, the maturity structure and we're adding liquidity to the system. What's actually happened, and I think Lynn Ald and others are on top of this here. Um, this guy Otavio actually had a good thread. That's a, I mean, just opening the buyback window up and even signaling, signaling that like a year before they plan to do it is just like, oh, we know there's going to be no demand for this. We're going to be the only buyers. That's exactly the point. Like essentially here, let's see the, there's a foreign buyers. This is like the big one. Foreign buyers are just opting out of the market. Um, this guy, Tavi Costa has some good graphs on this. Let's see. See if I can find this. Here we go. So, see this foreign holders of U.S. Treasuries is a percent of total debt. Can Comes you see back that to what two thousand three levels. Yeah. So and it's plummeting, right? It's accelerating now. So like in a sense, 2013 was peak America in this sense, like the most confident. Then people started just divesting, divesting, divesting. I mean, the year 2008, like basically up until this point, you know, maybe a little bit more, there's like a flight to quality. And then people like, ah, no, thank you very much. And they started divesting. This is also when wokeness started, you know, right. And now it's accelerating because there's, you know, you can, you don't have to save in treasuries. You know what you can save in? Obviously, Bitcoin, they're not there yet. I think El Salvador, hopefully, and, you know, uh, others can get them there. But what they're doing, which is also fine and good, is gold. Yeah. Gold is just going, I mean, this is his arrow over here, but it's gone way up, right? Um, like, here's the um, gold purchases. Like, Visual Capitalist has a better thing on this. If you go um, back to, like, the... In the beginning of the century, Russia and China have just been stacking gold like crazy. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? India has been too at the individual level. It's like, um, I'll show you a graph on that. So what's interesting is in Russia and China, it's at the state level. India it's driven at the individual level because um, of demonetization and a few other things. So you see this 30 years of central bank gold demand, kaboom, just going vertical over here, right? Yeah. And so... Uh, so the thing is that you have, I mean, here's, here's basically what just happened. Uh, putting it together, the Fed has killed its own banks. It's killed many of its institutional bond buyers. It has driven away foreign buyers of bonds. And it's about to issue tons of new bonds. And it's got a treasury buyback program. So now they're finally doing the thing where they're getting rid of all artifice and they're just connecting the Fed's printer to buy the bonds from Treasury. So the government issues bonds and the Fed either buys them directly with printed dollars or they get some straw purchaser like JPMC to do it and pretend that the Fed isn't buying them directly. Right. Yeah. But obviously, if the Fed is just directly buying bonds from Treasury and just printing the money and putting in the Treasury general account without. You see, part of the thing is the participation of foreigners and others in this. I mean. Imagine if, uh, like, if you just set up a company and, or you set up like your own cryptocurrency and you issued a ton of it and you said it was worth a million bucks, it is somebody else's participation in that that actually makes it have some value. Mm -hmm. And the more people who participate in it, the more it actually has value. Let's take, let's say, let's say it's a share in a company, right? Obviously, the more people who think that thing has value, the more it actually does. And the fewer, the less it does. So putting all the pieces together, the U.S. has just contracted on the global stage. It's not a unipolar world anymore. It's a multipolar world. Blinken is talking about negotiating with China over Ukraine. The U.S. has lost control of the Middle East. It's lost control of Brazil. It's lost control of India. It's lost control of certainly, um, you know, the um, like 
like a, countries like France and so on are, are breaking away from it, if not fully out of its control. It's fighting the, you know, it's lost control of Twitter. It's fighting, you know, grays and reds. The blues are fighting grays and reds domestically. And it's about to do these treasury buybacks in early 2024, which they've announced. So, so you know, you, you have something where they're going to just di either directly or through a straw purchaser print the money to fill up their own treasury. I think that's, that feels like end game to me, right? Yeah. Because there's going to be a huge amount of pressure to use that printed money to, or to print more, uh, to, to fix these mortgages or mortgage-backed securities, commercial real estate, all these things are crashing, um, to help people with student loan payments, to um, help people with credit card debt. You know, this concept of people's QE, if you've heard that. And I, I don't know how long it takes. Um, as I said, I think it's like 10% months, 70% years, 19% decades, 1% centuries, but I don't think it's like very long. If all that comes together, then putting it all together, you have something where every, the economy is like Swiss cheese with more holes than cheese because you can't like, it's not like there's like a healthy uh, personal savings you know, sector that you can tax to go and bail out the other parts. People are indebted up their eyeballs, right? Many households don't even have enough to pay like a few, you know, minor expenses. So if everything is Swiss cheese, you know, the only healthy sector you have is like the tech sector, maybe. And even that, you know, if you just mulch the whole thing, uh, it wouldn't pay for everything. So what happens, I think, is, you know, like a, like a gravitational black hole type implosion. <laughs> everything and anything, like when, when the, what the printing really represents is, Everything that can be seized will be seized. It's like this black hole of blue, right? Everything just gets dragged into the maw, not just your dollars. Like every stock that's on a blue exchange, um, certainly every bond, uh, probably blue real estate. And by the way, you know how like uh, this, is a, this is a scenario, right? But I mean, real estate seizures were actually very common in the 20th century, like the Soviet Union, Russia, like many countries had real estate seizures, land seizures. I think the chaotic version of that is, I mean, this is again, sci-fi scenario. After all, the Fed has done, uh, it's bought your mortgage backed securities, right? Mm -hmm. So it owns a big piece of your house. So you need to allow uh, unhoused people to go and live in your house. Yeah. <laughs> Got that okay? extra bedroom still, don't you? Right. And the thing is, anti-squatting or the, like the, the squatting laws and stuff in California, they keep weakening them. I mean, is this that far away from allowing a homeless person to sleep in the doorway of a guy with a small business? That's common in San Francisco, right? And you just take it one step further and you say, oh, well, guess what? The Fed bought a piece of your house. So therefore, you need to open up the garage for these people who don't have home. Like, that's one way you can do property seizures. There's probably 50 other ways you can do it, okay, if, if the government is really getting creative with this stuff. But, I mean, Credit Suisse showed that property rights are not sacrosanct, even in Switzerland. The bondholders, $17 billion in bonds destroyed. You don't have to care about those bondholders to know that even really rich, well-connected people in blue America and blue controlled territory, like blue G7 states, their property rights, these multi-billionaires are getting totally wrecked by the state they trusted. That means that the average Joe has absolutely no chance unless they get out, right? That's, what, that's a lesson really of SVB or whatever, is every one of these tech guys, all of these CEOs, 40,000 tech CEOs, many of whom are blues, just got absolutely blindsided by the establishment. Like essentially their life savings go, and there's no, there's no heads up. There's no warning that, you know, you, you have this notification on your website. Oh, like, uh, I've got, I've got cookies. Okay. The regulars push to, to see that you've got cookie, you know, that you know that you've got uh, cookies or not on your bank website. You know, they don't push the notification saying your bank is insolvent. And this <laughs> right. is, do you know what I'm saying? Right. So it's all the regulation, none of the protection. It's an arco tyranny. And it's true for not just, again, as I said, not just SVB, all the banks have this problem, or let's say a very large percentage of them. And so if you put all that together, this thing is just, I mean, one of the reasons that I, you know, put out the video and the stuff that I did, like, you know, a few weeks ago, is when you, when you kind of look at the, the synthesis of everything, it's Wiley Coyote world. It's literally just over thin air. 
right? Uh, you know, and again, I can I can cite study after study, but I'll just give you a few more, right? Here is the uh, here's the Stanford study, um, the two point two trillion number here. Many banks face the same risks that brought down SVB. A sobering new analysis finds the banking sector's unrealized losses. I mean, 620 billion was big, but they're thinking it's 2.2 trillion. Who the hell knows what the actual number is, right? They looked at 4,800 US banks and they found uh, SVB is not an outlier. That's the thing. It's not like some tech guys doing crazy things, okay? Many other banks have these issues, okay? Rubini, who hates crypto um, and is coming at it from a totally different direction, is saying something very similar, right? Uh, most U.S. banks are technically near insolvency and hundreds are already fully insolvent, right? Um, and basically, uh, here is Dalio. Again, saying some of the same things that I've been saying, which are, it's not just a banking issue, it's a global issue. All sorts of entities, pension funds, insurance companies, all around the world, there was a lot of buying of these government bonds, which have gone down in value. And it wasn't, by the way, like people will keep talking about interest rate risk and so on, duration risk. It's not risk in the sense of like being hit by a tornado. It's not duration risk, it's devaluation policy. The Fed has a lever where they devalue the asset that the Treasury just sold to people. You know, it's literally like you sold some people something, you said it's worth a billion dollars, and I hit a button, it's worth $800 million. Yeah. And now you're totally destroyed. And then when you go bankrupt, it's blamed on you, right? That's basically what's happened. So, so this system, I, 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 it's like it's this wily coyote system where everything is, is basically. There's fake. no, there's, it's fake and there's like only error beneath it. And I don't know when people are going to look down, but when they do, they're going to be like, okay, can I grab onto some, something hard? So, you know, some, some, some territory, some, um, some firm like piece of land amidst this just total descent, right? That's Bitcoin, that's gold, that's the allocation. I think location is if you are in America, be in a red state, but I think it's going to get I mean, I think it's going to be potentially quite nasty. Like, I, I just got to say, it's like, you know, it's something where a rich country that suddenly becomes poor, I mean, you know, like, I, I look at BLM and Jan 6 as, as like a flash forward, like a preview Tremors. of the future. Go ahead. Tremors before the big earthquake. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, there was this thing... Um, you know, it's hard to track this stuff, but these guys did a good job. Like civil unrest has just been rising in the U.S. It's stochastic, but uh, you, you have the general sense of the place being just more disorder. Like, look at it. Here's a, you see this GIF over here, mm. right? So there's like shooting, riot, etc., and um, you know, it's like. There's a few, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's stochastic, so it goes up and down, but it does seem to – so here's, like, BLM-type stuff starting then. More. More. Holy shit. These are all major incidents, by the way. And it ebbs, and then, oh. I mean, this is like, this is way bigger than this, right? Like, this is just, you know, just some of the George Floyd incidents. And, um, I mean, there's another map, like the, uh, I mean, there's, there's a few of these, but. Yeah. No, you can feel it, too. Who knows this, if it's the Twitter algo or. If it's real signal, just like the amount of videos you see of people fighting in the streets and yeah, shooting it, each other. 
Yeah, it's like, it's like not, it's, yeah, look at this. This is like how many different, you know, protests and rallies and so on were there, right? That's like hundreds. It's like all the way to Alaska and Hawaii and whatnot, right? Um, so exactly, you just feel a society that's, it's not even necessarily all ideological. It's just disordered, right? It's guys with face tattoos and it's just like, Look, I mean, you can be pro Second Amendment, but there's a lot of shootings, random shootings. You know, um, it's it's you know, it's something where this is also before an economic collapse has happened, right? And unlike 2020, there isn't lockdown, so people aren't kept in their houses or whatever, right? So. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 it's one of the things about all of this is a lot of these things are digital, where they're so everyone's everyone. For example, like after SVB, you know, and, and the banking stuff, everybody became. They were like, oh, of course, you don't keep more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars in a bank account. The FDIC limit is there. Blah 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 blah. And you know why that's actually totally bullshit. It's bullshit because the FDIC itself, you see that clip that I played where they themselves talk about how they don't want to tell the public too much about the FDIC yeah, they're limit. they're like wargaming it. In like they're wargaming it. And they're, they're like, the public thinks that these banks are more safe than we do. And uh, we wouldn't want them to get the wrong idea. We wouldn't want them to outside. Everybody in this room can understand the legalese, but outside this room, we, they, they, they shouldn't, right? So it's like intentional that people were kept unaware of FDIC limits, or it's not top of mind. In the same way that the banks hid their insolvency, they tell you that they're that you've got cookies on the website, but they hid their insolvency, right? So, I mean, I'll just give you one more thing on this, which is, um, like, basically, Janet Yellen. Um, Did not sound alarm about the mortgage crisis. Here, let me find it. Yellen or Bernanke, subprime isn't contained, or are we talking recently? Uh, well, there's a few of them um, here. Yellen feared housing bust, but did not raise public alarm, right? Essentially, they're not going to tell you, okay? I collected a bunch of links on this, right? But basically, those who can see the analytics, they, you know, they're, they're only going to tell you there's a quote crisis if it's um, it's like the debt ceiling thing where it's like in their in their interests, right? Here's another example: like April 10th, 2008. Do you see this? Bernanke says U.S. could be facing a mild recession. Yeah. Okay. April 13th, 2023. Jerome Powell says a mild recession. Okay. Now remember, by the way. He said this after basically what happened was on April 10, 2008, after his Fed intervened in a massive bank failure, which was Bear Stearns, Bernanke reassuringly told us we might be facing a mild recession. Within 158 days, the world realized it was actually in the midst of a devastating global financial crisis. Wall Street ran to the exits before Main Street even knew it was happening, and then the printing of trillions began. 158 days, okay? Almost exactly 15 years to the day later. On April 13th, 2023, after his Fed intervened in a massive bank failure, Jerome Powell again reassuringly told us we might be facing a mild recession. This time, the world may soon realize it's actually in the midst of a global fiat crisis, but this time the world might get to the exits before the Fed uses them as exit liquidity if they can get there before the printing of trillions begins. Thank God we have that. That's why. Though. Exactly, right? So... So that's allocation, location, I think, red states or foreign states. I mean, if you want to live in an Anglo country, Australia and New Zealand are actually the best managed. I showed some numbers on this, but they have surprisingly good debt to GDP ratios and other things. Um, I, for Maybe it's the China influence or what have you. Australia actually still digs stuff out of the ground and sells it. They're like more in contact with reality to a greater extent. Like in a sense, Australia's conservatives are actually cutting spending and you know restricting immigration to skilled immigration and Australia's liberals are actually against war with China like Kevin Rudd you know mm -hmm. so it's like a functional right and left where you know in in, in the ideal circumstance they complement each other it's like a steering wheel you know and you can argue okay maybe center right or center left but overall i feel like they're they've just got a higher state capacity 
you know, down, something about down under, right? And in a sense, it might be like Australia and New Zealand are to the Anglo world this century what Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore were to the Chinese world last century. They're like the relative islands of relative stability when a lot of the rest is just totally melting down after this you know, whole thing. Another analogy, by the way, one more analogy here is, uh, is Argentina. Mm -hmm. How much do you know about Argentina? Yeah, no. They've had a crazy hyperinflationary crisis after crisis, but they seem relatively yes. stable, all things considered. Well, uh, I mean, not so. I mean, uh, I actually don't know where they are as of right now, but they were censoring inflation numbers recently. The main thing about Argentina is they were a rich country that became poor. Okay. Argentina's unprecedented economic boom to bust history. Okay. Riches in Argentina was once, so like in the early 20th century, remember my thing about history running in reverse. A rich country that became poor. Riches in Argentina was once a commonplace when it was one of the wealthiest in the world. Now it faces bankruptcy and staggering debt and a saga it can't seem to escape. Do you know how it became poor? It went from among the very top economies to the very bottom of the list. Right? Can you see the screen? Yeah, bud buddied yeah. up with the IMF too many times. <laughs> well, no, is that, well, is that, I mean, maybe nowadays, yes, but essentially, until the middle of the century, such a scenario is simply unimaginable, right? And at the end of World War II, it was considered one of the most stable currencies in the world alongside the pound and the dollar, okay? And then the boom was nowhere in sight. It was a magnet for, you know, even in the 1950s, it was significantly higher than in Germany. But then what happened was, Argentina's decline was well underway, okay? And what happened was this guy, Juan Perón, what did he do? The Perón's guiding principle was profligacy. And then when nothing else worked, to go into debt, print money, and let inflation gallop. Triple state expenditures and double the number of state employees. Does that sound familiar? Right? But now, here's the other thing. The other thing they did was right-wing stuff. As part of an Argentina-first policy, tariff barriers were put in place to protect the country's weak industrial base, the aim for Argentina to be as self-sufficient as possible. Gas plants were purchased. A staggering number of inefficient state companies were founded. And uh, nothing symbolized more than the purchase of Great Britain's ailing railway system, 150 million GBP, 487 billion for expensive junk equipment. Fireworks were set off. You know, the disaster was celebrated as a national triumph. By the time a few years had passed, Argentina slipped into its first deep economic crisis, right? And then massive... So the point is, like... This We're rhymes a lot. It rhymes a lot with the current moment. Yeah. Where it's a rich country that thought it had infinite runway and it combined like the worst of left and right, like the nationalism of we can build everything in the country and the socialism of we'll print all the money and, 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 and give it out there. It didn't have the same worst. That's true, not to the same extent. But uh, it did have like, you know, $100 billion dollar inefficient train. Go ahead. It's mechanically the same. Similar, right? Yeah. So, um, and then finally, I think the third thing, I was just saying, lo allocation, location, organization. Meaning, store of value, like the ultimate, you know, store of value is really a high trust community. Because if you're just like a, this is why, I mean, like I'm sympathetic to the book, The Sovereign Individual. I like it. It's a good book. But I do believe in The Sovereign Collective you know, the startup society, the network state, right? Where um, it's not just somebody on their own because humans are social animals. You know, like, uh, you know that Steve Jobs email that was making the rounds a while back where he's like, I do not go and cut my own wood. I don't, um, you know, I don't provide my own power. Like I, I, I'm all these people around me are this web of people that I'm dependent on, right? And mm -hmm. if anybody had a right to be like, you know, that obviously Steve Jobs is an amazing person and does a lot more than most people. But even he understood that he had to be cooperative with other people on, on things, right? And so I think that's the third thing is to not just be every man for yourself, but after you take care of yourself, after you win, then figure out, like, ideally you start building your community now, right? So that's organization. Even literally 10-person meetups, building local community and trust or whatever, you know, 20 person, whatever it is, right? That's way better than um, just 
like not having a community to fall on in the event like there's, you know, s some issue of some kind, right? So it's like yeah. allocation, location, organization. All right, let me pause there. I know um, I just, I just <laughs> that was a big just did, download. Go, yeah. We just did four and a half hours. This is going to be, I think this might be the longest podcast we've ever recorded. And all right, probably one where I spoke to, spoke the least but i'm happy it turned out that way because just letting you run with all this stuff again because like i said earlier like the um the way in which you connect the dots so elaborately and i, I really like that that history like uh we're moving from the central point if you go backwards yeah. in time forward in time we're seeing this sort of reflection in this rhyming and i mean i completely agree with oh well, pretty much everything you just said like again i think this is an important conversation to have and needs to be had more out in the open because again i'm a big believer in we just need to confront this reality as quickly as possible rip the band-aid off get as many people on the lifeboats and bitcoin and um, red states and smaller communities as possible as quickly as possible and so thank you for putting this all together i mean Th thank you sir uh, I have a couple of questions, one or two for you, if you wouldn't mind, which are, sure. um, so, you know, you said I, um, oh, one thing I would just say history of running in reverse executive order six, one Oh two, you know, the gold, the gold seizures and so on. I think they're going to try something again, but history is running in reverse. So this time they fail. Yeah. Right. And so that's like another way of like thinking about the hour of history or what have you. Um, I'd, I'd like to know, you know, you mentioned that me putting it together was a, was like a black pill or something. I didn't mean it like that uh, because I actually think like red states and Western European countries will probably do better afterwards. Um, you know, like as independent kind of things, but I, I'd like to know what you found most interesting or what, what do you feel like connected or what was novel that'd be, uh, you know, you can cut this part if you want, but just, you know, for my, no, interest. we'll keep it in the, uh, I think the, what I mentioned, like the history rhyming. Uh, if you go backward mm. in time and forward in time from 1950 and look at the sort of reflection, really try something. Cause that's something we say a lot is like, uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And a lot of people point to Weimar and, uh, the Roman empire comparing it to the U S empire, but tying in like Soviet Russia, um, China, I think that really, <laughs> it shows like the magnitude of, of what this is. It's not just some isolated uh, empirical downfall like that's happened. Uh, that happened in Rome and in Weimar. It's like much bigger than that. I think that's what I got from it. And then the other thing is just how oblivious most people are. Like the uh, wily coyote sitting out in the open air. Most people do not understand. Um, and which is scary. It's, yeah. It's, you know, what's weird about that is. I think there's a big gap. I think the single biggest binary predictor is actually like U.S. citizen versus not. Because yes. like people outside, uh, this is the thing. All right, ready? Here's the most, here's the weirdest thing I might say. Okay. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, I'm prepared for this, right? Okay. So here's a weird one. Um, and you might, you might disagree with my framing. Okay. But just bear with me for a second. In early, in like January 2020, most people at the time didn't, you know, like journalists would call you uh, a racist, et cetera, for saying that COVID-19 might become a thing. Like, oh, you know, I can't believe you're talking about a virus from China as if it could be a risk. It's a non-issue. Uh, you know, I can't believe you're stirring up, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? They were attacking, I don't know if you remember that time period, January yeah. 2020, yeah. right? Okay. And, uh, so that was like the mainstream opinion. This is nothing to worry about, nothing to be concerned about, citizen. Shut up. You're an idiot. Okay. And then there was a contrarian opinion that, hey, actually this thing that China shut down an entire city for might be concerning and we should pay attention to it because there's like a physics of this or a biophysics or, or a biology that suggests that, that virus could go really vertical and it seems to be infecting a lot of people. And but what's happened as of today, and again, this is where you, your audience or you might disagree with the framing, but two or three years later, the numbers 
reported are 700 million people infected, 7 million people died, including 1 million Americans, A. But B, people don't think it was that big a deal. Which means, like, this, this thing, like, if I had said in January 2020, 1 million Americans will die, 7 million, millions of people worldwide will die, like, that would have been considered so extreme. I was, like, very measured, actually, I think at the time in the public statements, right? That would be considered so extreme and so crazy. That's like an end of the world scenario. You're saying millions of people are going to die from this? Are you crazy? You're stoking panic, et cetera. But now today, that's not only in the rear view mirror. We're like, eh, who cares, right? Now, you may, people may disagree with the death counts or well, I, I get that. There's folks in your audience who, who, who may disagree with me on this. My point, though, is like the magnitude of the kind of thing that one can process and then say, hey, it wasn't that bad is actually surprising. Mm -hmm. And I actually kind of think that while this upcoming fiat crisis will be quite disruptive, I actually think that like the world will actually get on okay because yeah. most manufacturing is actually outside the US. Most like oil and stuff is outside. Lots of stuff is outside. It's kind of the opposite of the Zihan argument. Most of the world is actually decoupled in reverse, right? I show you that graph with all, all the stuff, right? Yeah. And so what that kind of means, I think, is that like the economy will kind of keep ticking. I mean, it'll take a hit globally, but it'll kind of keep ticking. And the worst hit places will be those that are closest to blue America. I think red America will do okay when it gets back to, you know, like, for, uh, for example, it can actually build a pipeline again, or it can, uh, maybe it won't have property rights, but we don't know. Um, but it can, it can cut things down without like federal regulations blocking it from things. And, uh, Western Europe can do things without these crazy carbon credit kind of things that are all pushed top down. They can rebuild their energy production. Um, but it's, it's one of these things where I don't know if that's quite a white pill, but it's like the Humans bounce back. Yeah. It's like, I, I kind of think blue America is going to get the worst of it. That is my hunch because uh they they will be the last they will be in this case the ones that hold on to the dollar and the institutions all the way down and others are exiting already before them and building so it's like the world. opposite of the 2008 pattern go ahead yeah they're and they're already building the new world too uh, yeah exactly so in 2008 it was republicans and foreigners that paid the price now it might be in reverse yeah I completely agree. It's not a black pill. It's a white pill. We're gonna, and I've been saying this in the newsletter and publicly, we just need to rip the bandaid off, come to grips with this sooner than later. Um, it seems like you believe that it's gonna be forced on us sooner than later, whether people want to delay it. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a non-zero probability of that. And yeah. I, you know, we'll, we'll see, stay humble, stack sets. <laughs> That's, I guess we can end it there. I have to run to a lunch, this has been an incredible, probably one of the best episodes we've ever recorded. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us. I think, again, this is an extremely converse, important conversation that needs to happen and more people need to listen to. And keep fighting the good fight. I know you've been getting a lot of shit for it, but I think it's important to get this view of the world out there. Yeah, I think I think people are coming around to it, but we'll see. Let's see. Let's see. I mean, I actually don't want to be proven right, but I do want people to build their local communities. So yeah. let's see if that happens. All right. Do it. Cool. Thanks. Talk soon. Peace and love, freaks. Okay. <laughs>